Thank you. All right. Welcome to my disputation and this trial lecture. Especially welcome to my honored guests that I uh, will greet properly afterwards. <laughs> Sorry for being late. I've been looking forward to this for a long, long time. Um, and it's great to see all of you here, friends and family, and you guys have traveled so far. All right, so as Safa said, the topic of the lecture is <clears throat> how might the grid function as a metaphor for a broader social or cultural logic in the 21st century? So I'll just briefly unpack that um, as on the screen here. Um, three particular areas of inve investigation are suggested, uh, music production, but not only music production, but across media realms, and also more generally in everyday life. So finally, the concept of technological tinkering is also mentioned, which suggests an inclusion of practices that challenge the norms and standards that the grid uh, typically represent. So, now I want you to imagine, let's see, that you are a group of graduate students and that the, this lecture is part of an imaginary course whose main takeaway is to investigate the profound intersections between media, culture, cultural production, and social context. So the imaginary course would be designed to introduce students to, particular intellectual, to a particular intellectual moment <laughs> Uh, in contemporary scholarship, characterized by critical engagement with the intersections of media, technology, culture, and society. Uh, so, as this uh, example shows, each lecture in such an imaginary course would present current understandings about the ways in which media technologies shape our understanding of the world and raise important questions about social cultural issues. Uh, each course tackles a media form or a format related to music production or media production as organizing concepts to address these broader issues across media and in everyday life. So this is just some context for lecture, I guess. So welcome to all my graduate students today. Today, the topic is grids with the slogan, we make grids and grids make us. In the context of music production, grids are quite prominent and visible, sometimes even tangible on our screens or as partitioned on our uh, grid-based controller instruments. So here, the grid 
refers to the use of digital audio workstations, DAWs, and music sequencers, where musical elements are aligned to a timeline, spatialized timeline that is partitioned into a spatial grid. Uh, <clears throat> this allows for precise control over timing, synchronization, and arrangement. Uh, and the grid provides a structured framework within which musical ideas are created, edited, and arranged. Um, and um, yeah, but in music production, we also find another kind of grid. They also dominate interface design of digital instruments and software. In Kim Bjorn's book on interface design. He write, writes quite uh, uh, enthusiastically, <laughs> suddenly they're everywhere, full of light, full of color, full of promise. The grid is literally a digital frontier. Here, sounds are organized in space instead of in time, like colors on a painter's palette. So this is the kind of grid that I want to talk the most about today, as we've covered uh, temporal manipulation in another lecture in this course. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, but th this is an important type of grid. So although music production is perhaps especially saturated by grids these days, they represent the fundamental design principle governing the design of software apps, web design, and all across media in general. Uh, for instance, in um, graphic design, video design, uh, video editing software, you have this palette of tools um, and modular design. Um, to speak with Heidegger for a moment, press um, ready at hand, right? You have them simultaneously present like a palette of tools you can interact with on your spatialized grid. Uh, but what about everyday life? Um, so to keep us in media and everyday life, we also have in web design interactions with like the coffee machine in the office, all sorts of screens surrounding us in cars, etc., that present this simultaneity to us, options on a flattened uh, spatial surface. Um, but grids that we tend to take more for granted and, and don't think about or interact with directly uh, are all around us in everyday life. So you have the urban grid, which we will have a look at soon, but I just included some images of other grids I recently stayed in a hotel where they had this grid of buttons. Uh, and I meant to have a picture from Burger King where I also had to choose from all 100 menus of weird burgers in a grid. And then I had to modulate that burger in a secondary tiered grid. And then a third if I wanted small and medium sized accessories. Yeah, you get my point, I think. So in everyday life, we also rely on grids to help us make sense of the amount of information from, a, from our chaotic modern society. And as we can see on the container bay, um, grids are all, also present in this kind of late capitalism, consumerist commodities, reality um, in a globalized 21st century on a, on a logistical scale as well. In our work, in our interaction with other people, in our leisure time, grids present us with endless possibilities of managing time. I just have my clock here. Uh, <clears throat> Managing uh, our time, we list, we count, we think, we imagine, 
plan, design, discover, produce, and organize stuff with the help of flattened surfaces where we can kind of think as a thinking tool with these spatialized grids. Grids construct our world as much as they represent the stuff in it. They constitute meaning or norms and standards for meaning making. So most of the time grids are so ubiquitous and ordinary, even mundane, that we don't really notice them. And we certainly don't spend a lot of energy thinking about uh, container garden grids or tiles on the bathroom floor, etc. Um, we don't think about the role that these types of grids play in our society, the spatial grids. Um, and also, if we zoom out a bit, we have the infrastructural level, where grids are even more Mm. Yeah, we govern our, our whole experience of all of these other grids. The most, the first thing, if you Google the grid, is the electrical grid. Right? If you pull the plug of the electrical grid, you lose all the other grids, in media production at least. So there's that. Um, still, as all things that become so ingrained in our cultural and technological imagination, they tend to be taken lightly or even for granted. They recede into the background together with norms and standards that they heed. Um, but as critical media scholarship reminds us, it is exactly when we're not thinking about them that we should consider forms and formats. And importantly, that's typically when they are the most ideological as well, shaping how we see the world and how we interact with it. So, just to finish off this introduction to grids, they're part of the fabric of general human interchange. Right? So we should be interested in what they do. And we should want to know what grids do. In this lecture, we're going to <clears throat> consider some of the ways in which the grid might function as a metaphor for broader social and cultural logic in the 21st century. Oh, I forgot to mention <laughs> the entertainment grids. That's self-explanatory. Um, all right, so what we're going to do now uh, is we when I'm talking about the grid as a metaphor, um, it can be understood as a conceptual framework that reinforces or challenges various existing social and cultural logic of the 21st century. Because as we will see, there is actually no such thing as the grid. Um, grids are manifold and govern information in different ways and they are not static or permanent, they constantly evolve and change. So in order for us to talk about the grid as a metaphor like this, uh, it requires some abstraction. So firstly, we're gonna dive deep into uh, a very abstracted view of the grid, or generalized view of the grid, uh, which is perhaps the most permeating way of using the grid as a metaphor in our society today. Um, the grid often refers to the systematic organization and standardization of time, space, and information. And it entails, let's see, it entails um, not only standardization, but uh, ho homogenization or homogeneity, flattening, let's say. I just need to find my cue here. Here we go. So, more on that soon, but at the same time, 
This model of a totalitarian grid that flattens everything is often taken too far. Uh, so I believe that it's important for us and for you graduate students to also examine how grids are not static or permanent structures, as I said, but forms that are shaped in use and that can also be bended, broken, or reinterpreted. So through a series of examples of how different grids configure across modern media, we will question the modern myth of the homogenizing grid, considering instead how grids invite practices of tinkering with time and space in ways that challenge or even resists regulation uh, and the norms and the standards that they entail. So, in the way that grids are used in new ways to play and make art, spatial and temporal grids provide the scaffolding for practices of tinkering in the 21st century. So lastly, uh, we will consider a different kind of um, abstracted metaphor of the grid. Um, and instead of look at how the information is presented to us in the grid, we can look at the grid as form, as tracery, as um, the fissures or relations between things, you know, intersectional, inter intersectionality, metaphor for intersectionality. All right. So, in her book, The Grid Book, art historian Hannah Higgins presents the urban grid as the archetype image of an emerging modernity. Embedded in this enormous gridded lattice are uniform apartments and office spaces carefully divided into smaller modules at uniform height, width, and length. So this is uh, La Plata in Argentina, I think, and some Spanish city. Sorry for not including names. Stockholm, actually and then New York with Central Park, just ex examples of, of this kind of um, grid plan of modern uh, metro, uh, uh, big cities. <laughs> the officer, offices were filled with supply, are filled with supplies um, delivered in boxes. Think about all the square boxes that come into this uh, modern uh, work buildings, buildings, or used to, at least. That's, well, yeah. These days, the boxes are metaphorical, right? They're emails and organized um, skeuomorphically inside the machines. The, my point is, the modern work environment is made up of such modules on the large scale and all the way down homogenized, and it comes as no surprise that the modern grid has been at times criticized as a mechanism of dehumanization, and at the same time uh, celebrated as uniquely effective or efficient. So, whenever we are talking about a social or cultural logic shaping media production and everyday life in the 21st century, we are quietly referencing Frederick Jameson's analysis of late capitalism and postmodern cultural capital. So in his framework, late capitalism refers to the advanced stage of capitalism, characterized by dominance of multinational corporations, the commodification of culture, and the erosion of traditional boundaries between production and consumption. From this, the grid, as metaphor, might represent the rationalization, standardization, and homo homogenization of different aspects of life, including consumption work, but also culture and media production. The greatest metaphor uh, for this kind of totalitarian society, or uh, yeah, the grid aligns with uh, um, aligns with Jameson's uh, ideas of the erasure of local particularities and the flattening of cultural diversity under the influence of global capitalism as well. So the grid metaphor might refer to the uniformity and standardization imposed by global capitalism, which reduces cultural differences and uniquenesses to a series of interchangeable or repli replicable elements without strong identities or depth. So in other words, this version of the grid as metaphor represents the rationalized, homogenized structures that, 
that imposes a standardized framework on diverse cultural practices, erasing their local specificities. So overall, the metaphor of the grid in the 21st century, this metaphor, captures the social and cultural logic of late capitalism, but takes it further than Jameson would, I think, <laughs> emphasizing only its rationalization, standardization, homogenization, and fragmentation of subjectivity. It represents the dominant mode of organization and spatial arrangement in society, deeply shaped by the forces of global capitalism. So, one could even argue that the grid is the dominant mythological form of modern life. Visualization of modernity's faith in rational thought uh, that includes everything from the urban landscape to the power grid, as we discussed. And the modernist painting. Uh, let's see. Yeah. I'll just jump to that, I think. <laughs> So in 1979, art historian Rosalind Krauss wrote an article titled Grids, an essay that described this mythology, uh, the exaggerated version of, of this grid and its limits. She describes the grid of modernist painting as, and I quote, flattened, geometri geometricized, <laughs> ordered, anti-natural, anti-mimetic, anti-real. It is what art's art looks like when it turns its back on nature." Unquote. Following Krauss's account, the modernist grid is an emblem of industry, right? As we saw, it reflects mass production and the newly smooth mechanics of production techniques, of reproduction. This is just to say that in modern imagination, even in our uh, society of late capitalism. The grid pits culture against nature and the body, and as she writes, it turns its back on nature. So equally importantly, it reflects an evolutionary, even unavoidable allegiance towards these efficiencies, a feeling that we can't escape how this flattening um, shapes our, our world as we will see shortly, some examples of. The grid is the means of crowding out the dimensions of the real, Higgins writes, and replacing them with aesthetic decree. But this account fails, according to Higgins, the author of the grid book. Let's see if I can <laughs> show you that book. It fails to explain the wide variety of grids throughout history. Their continued use long after their function on behalf of one group has dissipated and the changing use of each grid within and beyond its original context. Her book is all about how the grid has a history that long predates modernity and the living material excluded by these processes of crowding out in the view of modernist painters and our use of that kind of metaphor uh, is exactly what the grid frames in its many non-modern forms. It includes organization of, of life and vitality and indeed what has emerged in many of its modern 21st century expressions display similar tendencies, as we shall see. Um, she has this idea of, of the urban grid, Higgins, where she takes, as I said, it's like, it's like modules from the largest to the offices, to the cubicles, to the, but she takes it even further and talks about the brick, the first module 
in Mesopotamia and how uh, homogeneous, the smallest possible homogeneous units can be put together in, in various, in, in so <laughs> heterogeneous ways and build different things. Think of Legos, for instance. Think of, of Minecraft, which is a, a modern version of Legos, where you enter into this spatial grid and then you abstract the um, aesthetic decree of the game and instead show the grid lines of the architecture of the game and enable, it's, it's a sandbox game for kids or grown-ups, where you can build stuff from modules, right? You have uniform blocks and you can build, people have built, spent months building one-to-one um, -one replicas of uh, the Death Star, for instance. It's like, it's insane. Anyway, the brick for Higgins serves another uh, rhetorical <laughs> purpose. Um, in, in, the, in the building structure, where you don't see the individual bricks, we see modernity, we see power. Uh, but what happens when the building is broken? It's rubble. It's the opposite. Uh, it, it's a place where settlers of anarchists and and um, out, outsiders, that's the word I'm looking for, can settle and then resist <laughs> this homogenizing feature of the grid. And then, in a modern media uh, context, the brick, all the way from pre-ancient societies to the American war in Iraq, she write, writes about, is, is the symbol of, of Iraqi people throwing the bricks <laughs> on the soldiers as a way of, of kind of spanning that whole gap from the totalitarian building structures on Manhattan, for instance, and the rubbles of under, well, broken societies. Okay. Let me see if I can... This is just a schematic of, uh, I meant to show you, of the urban grid of uh, New York, and then a schematic of organizing apartments as modules, and even green gardens as modules. Uh, yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> we should start the next part then. What is technological tinkering? Technological tinkering it refers to the practice of experimenting, modifying, or repurposing technologies to create new applications, functionalities, and forms of expression with them. So it involves a hands-on approach to technology, often driven by curiosity, creativity, and a desire to explore uh, possibilities beyond their intended or intended use is perhaps not the best phrase, but um, Imagine use, <laughs> the user to be, from the inventor's side. Um, tinkering can be seen as a form of experimentation where individuals engage in iterative processes of trial and error to gain a deeper understanding of technology and its potential. So in a way, through tinkering, things become what they are as well. The whole story of Silicon Valley is about tinkering, if you viewed like that. Okay, so tinkering is included here to point toward a conceptual framework for thinking about the diversity of practices associated with spatial and temporal tinkering in the 21st century. Um, so in the present day, technological tinkering continues to be uh, very prevalent um, in this moment of what is often referred to as participatory culture or maker culture, or DIY cultures. But it has also evolved alongside advancements in digital technology on the way. So with the emergence of postmodern media production techniques in the 21st century, 
and even uh, framed as late capitalism, tinkering takes some new forms, despite uh, the commodification and flattening of, of cultural societies. Um, in fact, tinkering is often influenced by this kind of commodification of te technology, processes of democratization, right, where more people could potentially tinker, although uh, we could discuss how that works in reality. So the influence of consumer, pro prosumer, <laughs> the merging of consumers and producers um, is important for understanding tinkering in the 21st century. So I thought I'd just mention a few important examples to our areas of interest. So one aspect of postmodern um, post media production techniques is the, rem uh, the remix, right? Remix culture, which involves sampling, repurposing and recombination of existing media content. And remixing can be seen as a form of technological tinkering because individual, individuals take pre-existing media and modify it to create new works. Um, but I'm more interested in how tinkering is not so abstracted, right? in terms of how tinkering could be said to be about practices of spatial tinkering or time tinkering, um, which, which kind of specifies and zooms in on practices of, of remix culture. Producing mashup music, for instance, is all about temporal tinkering and spatial tinkering converged. Um, so, for those who don't know that, mashups are created by aligning um, two uh, uh, disparate tracks on top of each other and finding ways that they fit, even though they are het het heterogeneous to begin with, and even quite dissimilar. All right. Um, that's one example. <laughs> In everyday life, technological tinkering can manifest in, in various ways, of course, such as tinkering with uh, our devices and repurposing technologies for alternative uses. Um, we're talking about, it depends on how strict you're with the definition of tinkering, but talking about personalization of our device, use of devices, right? the empowerment for individuals to shape their experience and interactions with their technologies by experimenting with them, learning more about how they can use them, like setting up your perfect productivity system on your computer, for instance, involves temporal tinkering because you time block in your calendar for, or you uh, have a spreadsheet where you tinker with all the loose pieces in your life. Well, I'm abstracting now. Because the grid is a form so resistant to definition, as you can hear, I focus on functions, not asking simply what a grid or a grid representation is, but what it does, right? It makes grid a bit hard to universalize into metaphors for society at large. Um, All right, something else, an example of how it functions. Anyone else old enough of you graduate students to have played World of Warcraft when it came out in 2004? So according to media, <laughs> media theorist Alexander Galloway, the interface of World of Warcraft, and I quote him, represents a, sh a sea change in the composition of media, unquote. He asks, what do we notice immediately about this 
image of the interface. First, where is the internal reality of the player? The diegetic space occurring within the context of the story. Galloway describes the bank banquet hall interior, the deep volumetric mode of representation that comes directly out of Renaissance perspective techniques relying on grids in painting before he asks, alternatively, where is the non-diegetic space? That is, the space external to the inner reality of the character in the story. It is this thin two-dimensional grid-based overlay, a heads-up display of sorts, containing abstractions, icons, text, signification, reliant more on letter and number iconographic images rather than, than realistic representational images. So here the interface is awash in information, right? Even someone unfamiliar with the game will notice this non-diegetic portion of the interface as important, if not more so, than the diegetic, the internal storyline dimension of the game. And oh, there's the grid-based inventory. That's why I chose this image. Uh, that was not by any means new, of course. Uh, Role-playing games had inventories long before that. Uh, one example that, that comes to mind is The Legend of Zelda, um, where you have a backpack of sorts with all your tools and gears. But then you go in and out of your metaphorical bag to re rearrange and change your gear before you go outside into the internal logic of the storyline again. But in World of Warcraft, as Galloway points out, the combination of an open world full of artifacts to gather stuff <laughs> combined with this kind of drag and drop heads up display backpack, um, raiding monsters with your friends, gather resources, buy and sell stuff from a merchant. This representation of belongings embodied the logic of late capitalism in a virtual format, right? This spatial grid layout is a presentation of storage uh, as spatial grids in the information age presents it. A fixed set of empty slots in a simple layout, each slot serving as a placeholder for interchangeable items. The restrictions on capacity is, for the most part, the number of slots available without regard for size or weight, something later role-playing games added for realism. But this backpack doesn't care, <laughs> as you can see. No, why is this relevant here? It illustrates a significant ways, way in which spatialization of grids on screens work, um, or rather in memory, binary memory, and then represented as spatial slots for uh, storage. This concept, the tracer of placeholders, is strangely familiar 15 years later uh, we carry with us our own heads-up display, grid-based, that is, with all our tools in our pockets, ready at hand. Um, and we all know how frustrating it is to have a limited amount of space or slots in our phone's memory. In World of Warcraft, you go and buy another backpack add more slots. We buy a new phone, for instance. So, okay. Um, new media theorists refer to this phenomenon as hy a hybrid language, Lev Manovich does, referring to the blending of physical and digital realities where the boundaries be between the real and the virtual become increasingly blurred. This is just an example of how spatial grids shape our interaction with technology in everyday life and media. So already in his treatise Simulacra and Simulation, French philosopher and cultural theorist Jean Baudrillard anticipated this hyperreal nature of postmodern society where simulations and science replace authentic experiences. 
He examined the relationship between reality, symbols, and society, and critiqued the impact on consu of consumer culture and the media in shaping our perception of reality. So, tinkering with space uh, adds another dimension with augmented reality and virtual reality in late, ca late capitalism society. Um, these inventions rely on spatial grids or coordinates to enable accurate and realistic experiences and require a lot of iterative prototyping and tinkering with it. So, Lastly, <laughs> let's talk about grid metaphor as intersectionality. <clears throat> so, that is just to present an alternative module or um, model rather for uh, the grid as a metaphor. Um, if you think about the important social cultural issues of the day like representation and gender, race, <laughs> sexuality, LGBTQ issues for instance, these intersects with cultures of production and the issue of, or, or the, the logic of uh, democratization uh, is often complex because of this. Some, some groups <laughs> are, have, have several, several intersecting um, uh, relationships to, to our um, hindrances that come in the way of, of uh, becoming part of a, a production culture, making stuff. So, to end with a, a different take on the grid as metaphor, I just wanted to present the idea of visualizing complex cultural and social issues. And, for instance, um, progress in terms of democratization and, and making uh, cultures of media production available to more people in terms of intersectionality. Um, so to end with, I, I wanted to refer to philosopher, Gra philosopher uh, Graham Harmon who talks about this Um, object-oriented ontologies, <laughs> where things never really interact with one another in ways that we can map on, on metaphorical abstraction or a grid where stuff neatly fits into cells that make sense. Instead, they fuse or com connect to each other in complex ways. Uh, these means of interaction often remain unknown, or it's, it's complex to trace them. Um, so Harmon uses the analogy of a jigsaw puzzle to illustrate how things interact in complex system. Instead of, and I quote, instead of mimicking the original image, it is riddled with fissures and strategic overlaps that place everything in a new light. So in the drawback of intersectionality as a way, as a, um, in socio, uh, fields of sociology and cultural studies, it's presented as a solution, right? We should think intersectionally uh, in terms to, to address this issue of, of um, com compartmentalization. You see the tracery and, and the relationship between <laughs> issues is easier to find new solutions and see the whole picture and create policy, etc. One drawback with it is intersectionality also 
um, shines a new light on everything in and of itself. Mm. But nevertheless, I think there's something in, if, if you want to have the grid as a universal metaphor for broader social and cultural aspects of society, it's better understood as intersection, intersectionality than homogenizing uh, lattice or standardization. Um, you can understand the relation of pieces in a puzzle by tracing the fissures. We can understand how social hierarchies work by tracing the intersections between them, as Harman says. Right. I guess I'll say thank you then. Um, pleasure. Thank you. Uh, we will now take a break of one hour and 15 minutes, and uh, these proce proceedings will resume at 12.15. Have a nice lunch or a break if you, do if you don't intend to eat. <laughs>
<clears throat> All right. Thank you, Safa. Um, I'm now going to provide a description or <clears throat> tell you guys about my project. Um, my thesis uh, concerns different practices of what I call time tinkering. That is, the deliberate experimentation with time, structure and rhythm in contexts of producing machine rhythm. So machine rhythm is here understood to be sounds ordered in musically meaningful patterns that are encoded in and performed by some kind of technological device. Um, so, my approach to this is based on a simple, yet often unsolicited, uh, unsolicited premise um, that machine rhythm understood as such presupposes a process of spatialization. While the flow of time is irreversible, media technologies have the remarkable abilities to transform time, store it in space, and then convert it back to time again. Oh, sorry. Uh, so this is the only basis on which machine rhythm can be produced and manipulated, I argue in my thesis. Um, just some short uh, background to my interest in this. I'm not sure what's going on with the... Let me try switching. So my interest in studying this is not that important, I guess, but... Here we go, yeah. <laughs> this correlation between musical rhythm and creative pr procedures um, of sound reproduction technologies. This correlation is an interest of mine uh, that stems from my own background as drummer and music producer. Um, so in my master's thesis, I focus on how different sampling technologies and their interface design have influenced how the practice of digital sampling um, has configured in popular music production. So this was something I wanted to explore more. Um, but so it happened that uh, I was lucky enough to be part of the early stages and later as a researcher on the time project here, <coughs> here at the University of Oslo and later uh, Ritmo here, led by Professor Anna Danielsen. Um, so, although I was not formally affiliated with the project during my PhD, I continued to work with them um, because our interest corresponded, um, the project's interest in timing and rhythm at a micro level corresponded with my interest of the present studies. Whereas the main goal of the time project was to gain insights into how sound affects where the temporal onset of sound is perceived in time. We shared a common interest in, in what I call time tinkering. So we were therefore uh, able to combine, I was able to combine my work in the time project and this other interest of the materiality or material conditions of producing machine rhythm 
in this PhD in a way that I, I'm really satisfied that, that it, um, I was able to or allowed to do that uh, in such a coherent way. So the overarching goal of the time project was to expand the study of microrhythm to include sound-related aspects of rhythm, such as amplitude envelope, what called temporal shape, intensity, and timbre. So among other things, we were interested in examining the concrete techniques used to achieve what um, music producers consider a good groove. But in our work of analyzing the interviews and music project files, of the EDM producers that we were lucky to obtain and have a look at, I soon realized that I was really interested in how the role of, of the grids, the universalized way to, to approach time on our screens and in our production tools, and also waveform representations governed this tinkering with time for these producers, but generally. So that's when I became convinced that I wanted to combine the insights gained from this study in the time project um, with a study of the historical development of techniques behind machine rhythm from a more socio-material, historically informed perspective. Um, so that's a bit about the background. Let's see. So the thesis, thesis itself uh, consists of two parts and four articles. Two in each part. So the first part of the thesis uh, I have named Technologies of Time Tinkering. And it approaches practices of time tinkering from a historical and technological perspective. So the first article, titled On Grids and Machine Rhythm, A Genealogy of Form, is about grids themselves. So here I demonstrate the spatial, that spatial grids have been used to organize sound in space in different mechanisms. Um, and to different ends uh, since antiquity, basically. And as such, grids cannot be easily defined. From this perspective, it is not enough to say that rhythms or rhythm rhythmic events are on or off the grid, as we typically do, whether physically or perceptibly. Um, but I believe that there are complicated and sometimes contradictory operations, these grids, observed in this article demand a precise tracing of how they function at each epistemological and technological moment in time. The article outlines a history of the grid as a paradigmatic form that informs the ways in which machine rhythm is both inscribed and understood at different moments. So through this analysis, I introduce grids of various kinds, conceptual grids, uh, notational grids, hardwired and computational grids. And I also interrogate how they have presented competing logics, um, logics such as epistemological, how time works, <laughs> disciplinary, how time regulates, and operational, how we can work with time at their time of introduction in these different rhythm machines. So first, the role of grids in mechanical, uh, I think I have some images for you. <laughs> grids in mechanical uh, automa automatons, 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 <laughs> is explored. Uh, so this is an illustration of a Carillon drum that is programmed by positioning pins before it rotates and activates a lever that um, pulls a string that drives a hammer into a bell, <laughs> basically. So quite sophisticated. Um, 
This is basically an example of one of the first binary programming robots. And it's on and off uh, patterns and uh, interchangeable. And uh, to the left, we see an image of people tinkering with the mechanism in order to uh, have the machine produce uh, the, uh, the kind of music they wanted it to produce. Ah. Uh, baroque, baroque music in the uh, uh, 1500s and 1600s um, that required both um, subdivisions in, in uh, eight and 16th notes and triplets. So that meant that they had to uh, hammer the, the nails to perform in between the grid, so to speak. Yeah. So the second uh, thing I, I look at is the introduction of electricity and wired circuits and how that changed the nature of the role of grids from mainly conceptual and kind of physical <laughs> and notational here to a constitutive and disciplinary factor. Oh, this is another example of uh, the first one, yeah. Miniaturized, but still based on the same principle. So this is one of uh, the electronic Wurlitzer sidemen that I have a look at. And the same principle goes here where you have you have to decide how many steps to the sequence you will, you will afford. And then uh, the grid <laughs> is uh, circular here, but, but it's uh, mapped to these electrical contacts, providing different patterns um, that you can the shift between. So, Here I argue that the grid becomes um, constitutive because it requires another layer of abstraction in the wiring and, and kind of um, uh, <laughs> mapping or uh, I guess yeah, mapping of uh, patterns um, that are not uh, sp spatialized notational in the same way requires another layer. And then, thirdly, I examine how techniques of step sequencing and quantization were introduced in the 1980s as a means of reinstating musically meaningful grids at the interface level. Um, even though patterns are soldered as, as a matrices of, of diodes, as you can see below here, it is actually kind of notational grid <laughs> because it's, it's the binary on and off uh, patterns once more. Uh, and I guess what I was talking about, oh, yeah. Sorry, my slides are, I'll leave it at that, I think to get through. <laughs> so the second article, <laughs> sorry, um, is about waveforms, uh, entitled Waveforms as Means of Time Tinkering. And it approaches the role of waveform representation from the emergence of digital audio workstations onward. Um, this chapter concerns the idea that standardized graphical formats of sound notation and representation become invisible invisible or embedded in our life, thus shaping what we think of as sound and music at different historical moments. So with the pervasiveness of multimodal media today, this notion of thinking about and looking at such effects of sound waves sorry, has been crystallized into mechanisms almost as natural as hearing the actual sound itself, right? But looking at a waveform um, how could I get the... <laughs> I 
wish I had my... Oh, here we go. <sighs> Sorry, almost as natural <laughs> as hearing the sound itself, right? Um, with the, yeah, and it's by far the most prevalent way of depicting recorded sound events in Western mainstream culture, as you can see in the illustration of here. So specifically, I argue in this article that the importance of considering the role of waveform representation on screen um, when discussing digital audio and music production. So approaching sound through waveforms has become so habitual that we take little notice of their in influence, even though they quietly constitute our sense of the capacities of recorded sound and music composition today. So in the article, I examine how waveforms not only represent uh, sound, but also represent an important means of producing sound in the digital age. Um, I consider how sounds are spatially organized and arranged in a matter, manner um, reminiscent of pencil and paper writing. It's what um, is described as the return of the symbolic by Wolfgang Ernst. Um, how sounds compared with tape recording of sound now are sequenced on a horizontal timeline and micro-edited to create innovative rhythmic fields, for instance. And how they are sliced up and eventually, not in this uh, door, but <laughs> eventually um, can be stretched and pitch, pitch and time corrected or pitch and time manipulated in, in new ways. Um, so just one of the things that I find really, that the idea of the return to the symbolic, that's about how, you know, uh, how uh, tape recordings are associated with expressive tinkering or, or um, manipulation because of the vulnerability of the medium itself. You can slice and cut and splice and make all sorts of temporal alignments with it. But, with um, the waveform arrangement view, it's more like writing notes in the sense that it operationalizes silence, the breaks between the cuts in, in spatializing, um, uh, like a ca blank canvas in which you position individual sounds and then you can move them and juxtapose them in accordance with each other on a in a precise way, uh, which is different. So typically we speak about uh, the era of endless uh, undo, where you can do um, unlimited amount of cuts and, and manipulations without risking loss of quali sound quality, or because we, work, we are in the digital realm working on a uh, copy, basically. But this is, to me, one of the more underestimated facets of, of uh, digital sound editing, the idea that you operationalize the bits between the sounds and work with sounds in relation with silence between them, just as you would in a notational paradigm. Only in a notational paradigm, it's pure symbolic relations and added expression in time would be up to the performer. Here it's uh, because of the resolution, the scale of the timeline, you can move milliseconds, right? Nudge here and there, as we'll see. <laughs> okay. Uh, I also discussed the arrival of more tactile manners away from interaction and some slicing technologies in this article. It's an example of an iPad app where you discuss how actually <laughs> touching the sound, even though it's so removed 
the chain, chain of indices are so removed, it feels strangely intuitive, um, also because of the spatialization, right? It's an unnatural, it's a frozen state um, of, of processing or spatial mapping of the partitioning of sound, but it's ready at hand to use uh, the Heidegger link again, where you can touch different parts and do funny stuff with it. Okay. So the next article, well, the second part, I should say, is about techniques of time tinkering. The first part was technologies of time tinkering. This is the part um, where I've written articles together with the colleagues in the time project. So the first, or the, the third in the thesis <laughs> is uh, this one here that also should have an image of Anne, I realize. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> You're always part of it, so I'm forgetting. <laughs> My bad. Anyway, it's called A Grid in Flux, Sound and Timing in Electronic Dance Music. And it focuses on the significance of grids and waveforms in the use of different techniques employed by EDM producers to shape the rhythm and group um, today. So researchers uh, have argued that temporal microdeviations from the metric grid, such as those produced by musicians in performance, are crucial to making a musical rhythm groovy and danceable. Um, so for some, the idea that it is electronic dance music that is <laughs> dance music would be uh, a conundrum in that sense because uh, it's, it's very much associated with on the grid, precise, regulated rhythm, right? But in this article, we aim to show that the microrhythmic component of an engaging groove involves the manipulation of um, timing on a micro scale, that's one thing, it needn't much uh, deviation from the grid in order to induce um, this feeling of groove. But more importantly, we also map out how the sonic features fundamentally contribute to shaping the groove as well, because they unfold the sounds, sonic features make the sounds unfold in time um, differently in interesting ways. So in, por in particular, we see seek in this um, article to demonstrate how EDM producers, uh, with their preference for a grid-based microtiming aesthetic, are very sensitive to and adept at manipulating such sonic features um, for expressive effects. So while well, adhering to a grid-based aesthetic, they experiment and prototype a tinker um, with the sound's timing in relation to the grid often through manipulating their waveform representations, for instance, uh, resulting in a grid influx. So, the last one. Just switch between them. <laughs> it's called, the article four is called Dynamic range processing's influence on perceived timing in electronic dance music. And that article describes how EDM producers, uh, based on our inter interviews and our work with the other articles, this particular technique stood out to us as something that we would write a separate article on because it was so interesting or so potent in, in across the interviews and also in the music that we analyzed. Uh, the producers all strive for achieving subtle rhythmic friction in relation to the grid by manipulating either the sound's onsets or, in this case, their envelope and intensity. So temporal envelope is how the sound unfolds in time. Because compression as a dynamic processor reshapes the sound signals 
temporal envelope. Um, scholars have previously noted that certain uses of sidechain compression can produce peculiar rhythmic effects, sending the sound in and out of the mix. So in this article, we have tried to interrogate and complicate this uh, notion by linking a description of the workings and effects of dynamic range processors, such as uh, compression, compressors, and uh, uh, in particular, the uh, use of comp compression that is called sidechain compression. Um, and linking that to empirical findings on the interaction between sound and perceived timing. And by analyzing multi-tracks and DAW project files, as well as released audio files, in this case, of selected EDM tracks, we demonstrate that sidechain compression affects the music in many possible ways, depending on the settings of the compressor's parameters, as well as rhythmic patterns and the sonic complexity of both the signal that triggers the compression and the sidechain signal itself. Right, so together the part uh, of my thesis provide new insights into how machine time and rhythm is conceptualized in different contexts of music making. And I'm interested in the capacities encoded within the grid and waveform um, as a form that relates to the ways in which it stores, processes and reproduces musical time by enabling its structured spatialization on a flattened surface which is um, key for all of these articles. Uh, by teasing out such spatial and structural dimensions of sound inscription, uh, I argue in my thesis that we can gain important insights into the role of the grid in the history of machine rhythm that would be missed by more conventional music, analytical, cultural, so even sociological, not even, <laughs> or sociological approaches. All right. My time's up, I think. Thank you. I would like to thank the candidate for the introduction. And we will take a short break now uh, to prepare uh, the, uh, the equi equipment for the first opponent. Uh, let's resume the meeting at one o'clock. Yeah, I don't want to do this on my own. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for everyone who's been involved in organizing this, this disputation. Uh, I feel very privileged to be here uh, as uh, a member of the committee for evaluating uh, your thesis, Bjornar. Um, I wrote back in March to recommend that the thesis be approved and was worthy of a public defence. So I now find myself described as an opponent in a disputation, and yet I would much rather position myself as a critical friend or a supportive colleague um, who's keen to have a dialogue about what is a very impressive uh, piece of work. So when Scotland take on Norway in the Ulaval Stadium in Oslo on Saturday as part of the European qualifiers, we may well be rivals um, and on opposite sides of the football pitch. But today, uh, I think we're playing in the same team. Um, we're playing seriously, though, to quote Pierre Bourdieu about the role of the academic. Um, and my aim today is to be both challenging, uh, but to be kind in my questioning. So you talk, you talk about kind of opening up lines of inquiry in the thesis, and I, I want to help you develop those, hopefully. So, the problem that Bjorner seeks to address makes, I think, for a very fruitful thesis in the way that it explores the production of rhythm using the grid and the waveform and looking at the history of digital audio workstations, among other technologies. Not only does he do this very skillfully, uh, tracing the history of visual representation of music making, but it also leads to further research questions around contemporary music production. For example, there are a number of references in the thesis to the phrase evading the grid. Uh, and it might be useful to reflect on those a little bit later on. Um, and I'll come back to that 
uh, towards uh, the end uh, of my questions. The methods used in the thesis, I think, are well chosen. They're also well suited to the purpose of the project. The historicization of rhythm machines in the first two articles is very sophisticated and draws on key theorists in media studies, Stern, Gittleman. It draws on science and technology studies, Latour, David Edgerton, and media archaeology, Hutami and Parika. The methodology for the interviews that forms the basis of the other two articles is detailed, though I wonder how the research findings might have been different if the project team had interviewed less internationally distinguished EDM producers. The writing throughout the thesis is excellent. I think that the first uh, article, or the, the, framing, the framing document in particular, I think is an, an example of kind of very strong, very clearly crafted, but also very sophisticated piece um, of writing. Um, but what I would say is that, that the authorial voice, even in the first two chapters, is quite different. Um, but you explain that, uh, I think quite rightly, that we kind of, we, you know, we vary our writing voice depending on the audience, depending on what, what journal we're writing for, depending on comments from reviewers. So, um, in terms of the questions I want to ask, I want to kind of start off by thinking about process. Uh, I will then kind of go on to look at the two main concepts that are used in the thesis. And then what I want to do towards the end, assuming that we have time, um, is to kind of think about where you go next with this research. So, um, in terms of, of process, this is the first time I, I've examined an article-based thesis. And as you know, on page 11, it provides both benefits and challenges. So you've been employed as a research assistant on projects here in, in Ritmo. Uh, you've been able to draw on collaborate research into microrhythm. Um, it's been published in you know, respected academic journals such as Music Theory Spectrum, Music Theory Online. So already there's firm evidence of you making an original contribution to the field of study, and yet also raises questions about the joint authorship of this thesis and whether the narrative around the published articles is structured in a way that forms a coherent whole. Okay, so what you might call the unitary idea that kind of structures the whole thesis. So as someone who describes myself as a music sociologist, um, I'd like to begin by asking about the process and the process of writing this thesis, okay? working on this thesis. So I've got a kind of series of questions um, just to ask, and very general questions just to kind of kick things off. What did you do? How did you choose these methods? What were the challenges and benefits of an article-based thesis? And lastly, how do you think an individually authored thesis would look compared to this kind of collaborative one with several authors? I hope that's not too many questions to throw at you. There we go. Thank you um, for that opening and the question. Questions. <laughs> but uh, on process, that's a great way to start this, I think. Um, so what, <laughs> what did we do and how was the two first, right? So it, it started with a, I guess, um, what's interesting to me about this as a process is um, that I started thinking about this before I joined the time project, thinking about, uh, as I mentioned, in interface design. Uh, and how it shapes different uh, affordances or invites different possibilities uh, in my master's work and then applied for, for this doctoral position, um, not affiliated with the time project, thinking that I would continue in that direction. But then it wasn't really clear how to map so, so for me, to reiterate uh, a bit <laughs> for you and for all, in, in my master's, uh, so sample-based music making <laughs> is very rhythmical, right? It, it's very much 
um, part of my argument in my masters that different interface designs uh, invite different, uh, let's say, uh, paradigms of sample procedures. Like a keyboard would um, evoke a kind of path dependency of this uh, uh, cultures of claviocentrism, right? Where you have new sounds on a, as you know a lot about, <laughs> new sounds on a familiar, already familiar interface. Like think of Pinch and Troco and how Mo Moog um, decided on the keyboard eventually, but wasn't really sure how <laughs> to navigate that. Uh, and I invest, uh, explored, rather, how um, I was, I was at, 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 some time, at some point interested in the rack, rack sampler as well, as something that is more like in between. But then the, the, um, the real uh, comparison in my masters was between this cultures of clavi uh, claviocentrism and, and how uh, pitched, <laughs> pitch uh, mapped sounds, although you can have complex sounds on a keyboard, uh, but how that compares to, to grid-based um, drum machine <laughs> paradigm samplers in terms of uh, inviting uh, recombinant forms of music making, right? So, um, with that said, it's, it's all about making um, recontextualizing complex sounds, sample from uh, recordings, etc. And that's a very, very uh, rhythmically intricate process. So I was already thinking about time, at least, and, and also rhythm, and, and how this kind of superimposed layers of rhythms, when you combine different samples, uh, is really interesting as, as a sample-based practice. And then we, we started our work uh, in the time project, as you said, uh, in between my master's and, and, and initially it, it really, really seemed like two different things until we started analyzing the music and, and I saw the waveforms on the grid, let's say, and I was thinking about how audio, timelines, space, <laughs> basically, because the grid controller is not in time, right? You punch in stuff on that, and then it becomes MIDI information in time. So, so that's the process. Um, what, what I'm doing in this thesis started with this kind of back and forth. I realized one of my biases as, mm -hmm. as um, a um, researcher, the historical inclinations and interest in social material history of instruments. My biases was I didn't know much about grids or waveforms. And I realized that working in the time project. So in that sense, this kind of mixture in the article base led to the how as well. <laughs> because uh, I was influenced by the, our analysis uh, in the time project as to what I wanted to do in my other part, I wanted to investigate how they work, right? And I forgot the next, <laughs> the, the third. Again, thanks, I mean, just thanks for outlining the initial ideas, you know, where, why you kind of went on to look at grids and waveforms, which of course become so key to the thesis. But in terms of the methods then, in terms of kind of choosing okay. um, analysis, in terms of choosing uh, the interviews that you did, certainly in the, those last two articles, um, that was kind of my next uh, Yeah, yeah, next yeah the next step. So it's very different from so the two parts, obviously. In the time project, we really had a collaborative, um, led by Anna, but uh, we collaborated on, on, um, on um, uh, choosing the, the, this kind of semi-structured interview guide. And uh, across genres, that's important, right, because Time project is interested in not just EDM music, but also uh, hip hop, and jazz music, and even Norwegian traditional fiddle, Hardanger uh, Fele music, and samba. So um, it needed to be some kind of uh, uh, general questions. 
to address uh, the role of, of sound and timing and sound timing interaction. Uh, but um, the nature of, of doing interviews like that is, is also deciding what we were really uh, after, right? We were mm -hmm. after how they saw their own practice, not some kind of general, generalizable uh, thing as such. But then the time project is huge and it's in two parts. So oh. I was part of the qualitative part, um, but the, there's a whole team of researchers in a quantitative <laughs> empirically driven part okay. as well that has actually done empirical uh -huh. studies and uh, stuff, perce perceptual uh, yeah. experiments to kind of try this interdisciplinary approach. So we were able to, at some point in the report, uh, you, you ask where uh, the listener <laughs> comes into all of this. And um, I guess at least indirectly in the context of that kind of article where we wanted to really address perception, <laughs> the listener comes into the time project framework because um, they were tested. <laughs> so it was really interesting for me to work in that context. Yeah. That was something I was going to come back to maybe later on in terms of um, where you go next, in terms of this is a form of ethnographic research. Um, but just to kind of finish this, particularly in a question, what you've described as being part of a project team uh, yeah. and collaborating and you know, quite an exciting process, I can imagine it being an interdisciplinary one, you know, working in Ritmo with you know, scholars across fields, not just in, in music. Um, so in terms of how that process develops, because ultimately, I guess, a thesis is you know, produced by you as the individual. You take responsibility for that. Mm. So yeah, just that final question was just really about how the thesis um, might have looked if you, know, you had been working on this solely on, on your own. So again, it comes back to that benefits and challenges. You know, what were the benefits of the, yeah. the multi-authored you know, work that you did? Uh, what were the challenges? Um, yeah. Of, of, you know, I guess mi mixing both, perhaps. It's a great question, uh, actually. And I've been thinking a lot about myself, um, um, how much I learned from working in that, that kind of environment, in that kind of team, um, on, on several levels, uh, and how fortunate I was to, to get that opportunity, first of all. But... Um, uh, so, so in terms of the benefits, <laughs> there are so many, uh, I'd say, and I've, I've been through some of them, right? Exposing me to, to uh, a, a much more nerdier approach to rhythm than I would uh, endeavor myself, right? I think the time component would have been uh, differently mm -hmm. emphasized, for sure. And also the micro, <laughs> obviously. Uh, as the time project maps. Um, and also, I'm, I'm so glad that the dynamics, the, the shaping of the temporal envelope, right? That's, that was not on my radar uh, mm -hmm. as such in that context, but um, I'm uh, j jumping ahead of here, but that's obviously one thing that might be investigated in, uh -huh. in that other yeah. uh, role of mine, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in, Challenges, shortly. Uh, the, um, I, I'm re really glad you, you liked the introductionary part thingy because that was a real challenge, I think, just because of the nature of the, the two parts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I struggle with that. Um, uh, so that's great. The format was a challenge, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in, as a researcher, uh, I see no real, uh, I see challenges, but not uh, downsides, I guess, mm -hmm. real um, hurt <laughs> from being exposed to, to this. Um, I wouldn't, it is kind of interdisciplinary, but it is a multi, <laughs> multidisciplinary at, yeah. at least. Right, right. That's made me grow a lot, I think. But um, uh, one last thing is, uh, how, would the, how would it look? It would look like the two first chapters only uh, with 
less focus on rhythm, I'm guessing. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. More perhaps uh, um, interface design, uh, the different levels of materiality, I guess, yeah. in instruments. And, and maybe some interviews uh, or some kind of uh, empirical fieldwork thingy that oh. I would have time to do then. Like yeah. Travel around uh, visiting. <laughs> some of these instruments, for instance. Yeah. Sort of. Cool. Yeah, I think it's an interesting type of thesis to, to examine, you know, the article based one, um, the collaboration aspect. And, you know, I mean, all, all theses are collaborations to a certain extent, even, you know, the more traditional version of the one in, in the UK where, you know, you're working with supervisors you, as your collaborators. So, you know, you, you may produce a piece of work that is, you know, only authored by one person, but of course there's always collaborations. There's collaborations when you're developing uh, ideas at conferences and you know, presenting uh, work to colleagues and getting feedback. And, and that, that kind of leads me on to a kind of follow-up question about, about process. Um, you mentioned Trevor Pinch earlier, and obviously his, his work is kind of central to, to many of us working in the study of music technology and particularly the history of um, music technology. And one of my favorite uh, academic articles by him is one called Telling Tales About How Concepts Develop. Um, the reason why it's one of my favorites is because he tries to answer two questions in it. Firstly, how did your initial concepts change over time into the finished story? And secondly, how were the key ideas settled upon in the end, refined and presented? So those are the two questions he's trying to answer. Um, so what he does in this article is he basically tells the backstory about the work that he did with Frank Trocco on the Moog. Oh. So it's totally fascinating. Um, you know, he talks about the fact that it was you know, a coincidence that he was teaching in Trumansburg, which just so happens to be where Moog developed the synthes synthesizers. Mm -hmm. He talks about working with colleagues who were studying the Havel healing practices, which is where the boundary objects concept comes from. Yeah. Um, he's learning from academic users at conferences. So he's very much talking about being reflexive and kind of refining ideas throughout the research process. So I guess what I'm kind of getting at is whether you can tell us today a bit more about the backstory of this research. Yeah. So how did your concepts change over time into the finished story that you present to us now? Um, how did the focus of the research change over time? What didn't go according to plan? What might you have done differently? I kind of, I speak, I kind of ask this question partly because, I, for example, my own thesis set out to examine music publishing in Scotland. Oh, really? I came to Oslo and presented some research about sampling, and suddenly my research <laughs> project changed <laughs> into a project about sampling. So I, I think that's why this article resonated so much with me. Uh, because it's about contingencies. It's about how our research focus changes so much over yeah. the, the course of a project. So I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the backstory. What's not told in this finished document? Uh, what, reveal the secrets of your, of your research process. All right. And any embarrassing stories as well that you... <laughs> great. Yeah, great question. I definitely have to check out that article. Sounds great. I haven't seen that. Um, <clears throat> oh, what to say? Um, um, I guess um, yeah, s similar kind of experience. Uh, um, coincidences, right? Yeah. Uh, meetings. Yeah. Um, so this didn't start out as a thesis that, if you break it down, champions the idea of, of, of spatialization. So if you mention space, 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 space in music production circles, people think of space like in reverb or delay, etc. But this kind of spatialization of of uh, time needed some getting used to for myself as well. 
and I've become some, somewhat uh, evangelistical <laughs> about the idea of space, right? It's become a concept that uh, I can't get rid of. It, it's like, a, yeah, it's like the, the grid. <laughs> I can't get off the grid. Mm. <laughs> or a the grid. And I, <laughs> and I, um, I guess that started when I, well, I, I got Kyle Devine here as my co-supervisor, and he's very interested in uh, other aspects of mu music technology than I, I had. I was also interested in them, but he introduced me to some worlds of thinking uh, about them, new to me. Some of our discussions definitely derailed my <laughs> project, but uh, it's ended up in a, in a much more cons uh, critical and, uh, for me, s uh, satisfying is not the best word, but um, meaningful directions. Uh, so that's one of the sources of my uh, honing of concepts, <laughs> mm -hmm. but also uh, other meetings, right, and settings. But, yeah. Um, I also had one, so uh, Ritmo has a uh, scientific advisory board where, uh, among others, uh, Jonathan Stern and Georgina Bourne. Uh, so we were able to uh, arrange some meetings with them, but they didn't really have time, or time was uh, limited, so we did it together. And that's one, uh, also uh, a coffee, one hour at a cafe in Oslo, right by their hotel. Mm -hmm. That really uh, shaped a lot of my thinking about the materiality of time, <laughs> as you can imagine. So yeah. I guess uh, a lot of coincidences. Um, but then reading into this, I, I'm a, I love research, uh, and I love reading, and I love spending time in libraries, and I love all of these books about seemingly mundane stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of is, is used as organizing concepts, right? So I wanted to find my own organizing concept eventually and then mm -hmm. it turned out to be time, and spatialization of time and so technologies. Uh -huh. I, I like how you've kind of taken that idea of time, which is obviously so important to the thesis, but also kind of use that as a way of reflecting on the process of doing research because <laughs> We all want more time to do research. We all want more time to spend in, in libraries. We want more time to talk to Jonathan Stern or Georgina yeah. Bone. Um, again, that there might be affordances and the, thing, the, the restrictions that are kind of placed on, on that research process. Um, if I can probe a little bit further and just kind of, um, I think that's kind of nicely explained what I was kind of getting at in terms of coincidences and, coincidences and meetings is, is the kind of two things that you touched on. Um, but yeah, what, what didn't go according to plan? Yeah. What, what might you have done differently? Are there any reflections now, you know, at the end of the process about, you know, whether this was four or five years ago when you kind of began the process, you know, looking back, what might have you done uh, differently or changed, for example? Well, the, there's one obvious answer to that. <laughs> and that's uh, the use of my time. <laughs> Basically, uh, there's so many documents <laughs> on my computers that, that kind of uh, traces up ideas for other chapters or mm -hmm. other ideas. That's one of the um, great things, but also challenging things of choosing an organizing concept to kind of guide your work. Because I had so many potential case studies that I ended up only reading for far too long. <laughs> so, so uh, um, but that's inevitable in a way, right? It's, it's just um, in terms of, uh, it didn't really derail as such, but I, um, I feel a missed uh, opportunity. It's a special time writing a thesis where you are allocated a lot of time to only research and write, right? So now that I'm uncertain what's next, yeah. And I have a lot of colleagues that, even though they continue in world research, they 
don't have time for their uh, evangelizing of concepts <laughs> kind of work. So, so you now have to think about how you tinker with time to give yourself more time oh, yeah. for, for research. Um, so kind of moving on to the concepts themselves and you've kind of, yeah, explained quite nicely how those concepts have developed um, over the course of the thesis, the writing, the research. Um, so I want to focus on, on the two that are kind of core to the thesis. The first is time tinkering, and the second is machine rhythm. Mm. Um, I think the first of these works really well as a way of kind of threading the thesis together. I think what is also impressive is in the way in, you, the way in which you draw on the work of scholars like David Edgerton, who's a current favourite of mine as well, the focus on old technologies, um, as so many of those technologies from the 80s that now are. Um, you use them to avoid what we might call an innovation-centric history. Um, you situate the design and development of the DAW in its grid and waveforms within this much longer historical context of older technologies like the Carillon, Carillon, Carillon cylinder yeah. uh, that you presented uh, and describe how these Carillonors, Carillonors, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, uh, the tinkerers who are are playing with these cylinders, are involved in a lifetime of tinkering um, on their instruments. But what you also do is you build a fascinating etymology of the word tinkering. Um, you know, it's a word, you know, as you kind of mentioned, you're from people who were kind of selling, uh, selling tin. Uh, it has those kind of connotations, um, still has these connotations, certainly in the UK, with people from a disadvantaged uh, background, uh, tinkerers. Um, but you also kind of trace it to its use in re more recent studies of musical instruments by Pinch and Trocker, um, by Steve Waxman. And I was really pleased to see that you'd also kind of drawn on uh, Tara Rogers' uh, work in her feminist historiography of synthesizers, uh, where she uses the idea uh, of the tinkerer. Now, what she does um, in, um, in the article, is it tink tinkering with cultural memory, I forget the, the exact title. What she does in that article is raise very important questions about the maleness of engineering cultures. Um, she talks about the, um, you know, the, the development of the RCA synthesizer in the 1950s and how she finds in the archives evidence of women being very interested in the synthesizer, but they don't get opportunities to, to learn how to use it. They're encouraged to do cookery classes or, or other things instead. Um, She's also very kind of critical of Pinch and Trockel. Uh, she feels they contribute to the mythology of Moog as what she calls the kind of humble hobbyist and tinkerer, mm -hmm. the kind of uh, the person who kind of works in basements to overcome uh, the bureaucratic workplace or the family home and revolutionize the processes of music making. So she feels that they kind of, you know, they hold Moog on the, the pedestal as, as the, the designer. Uh, and I felt perhaps there was an opportunity to say more in the thesis about the social processes uh, of instrument design. Um, but, you know, that's maybe something to develop. So I, th I think, well, tinkering is a useful concept um, to describe the co-construction of technology and users. I was a little bit unsure at times about how appropriate it was for describing certain practices uh, which are part of the musical, musical worlds that you explore in the thesis. So, for example, is tinkering a term that was used by the EDM producers who you interviewed as part of the research for art, uh, in Articles 3 and 4? Or um, are there examples of it being used by other EDM producers, you know, perhaps in magazines in the secondary literature? Um, you also suggest that it may also be applied to the producers of hip-hop. Um, but it's a term for me, I, I, I've, it's not something I've kind of, you know, in all, all the kind of readings I've done about hip-hop, it's not a term that props up. And I wonder if the reason for that is if it's kind of less relevant to the production values in that particular musical world or world. Possibly because, as you talk about, there's kind of connotations of tinkering as kind of amateurism. There's connotations of that in the handmade. So to get to my, my questions, <laughs> Is tinkering a term, therefore, um, that may be suited to, uh, to pre-digital practices? I don't know. Uh, or to perhaps certain musical worlds? Uh, 
also, can the concept, you know, can it be applied to music making that, you know, you talk about in the 17th and 18th century and the 21st century? Mm. Um, I guess what I'm kind of trying to get at is if we can apply it too readily, does it become a little bit ahistorical? So do we need to know about those tinkerers who are working with the cylinders? Do we need to know exactly how they were working? What language are we using to describe their practices? Um, is it a concept that can also be applied to kind of thinking about gender? Going back to Tara Rogers, um, you know, can we think about uh, whether tinkering is something that is gendered? Um, and if we're kind of thinking about tinkering, you know, if it, if it can be applied to hip hop, um, then is it, how does it relate to certain African-American practices of, of music making? So I think there's probably a lot, of, a lot in there. Uh, I'll let, let you unpack it. Um, but yeah, very just interested in kind of the terminology of tinkering um, and how we can ensure that it's, a, I think it does work as a way of structuring the thesis. But I wonder, do we need sort of historic, historical specificity mm. in terms of how we use the term? So, I mean, I, I was talking to a friend recently about tinkering, you know, having read your thesis. And I said, you know, is tinkering something that, that you do? And he, he said, tinkering, noodling. Noodling was how he described it. Noodling. Noodling, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Over to you. Yeah. Again, really interesting. Um, and I, I read this in the report as well as and, and giving it a lot of thought. Um. <laughs> okay. So, um, I, I s think I understand. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. So for me, the word tinkerer is, is English as a secondary language. It's an English term, right? So, um, I learned <laughs> new things about the connotations as to describe them. And whenever I found a new uh, article using the term, right? And um, you are right, in, in some contexts, it is definitely linked with uh, this, this kind of uh, male homosocial in the garage kind of tinkering with physical objects, and cars, etc. Mm -hmm. But then, um, in other historical texts, no histories of tinkering, uh, like Kathleen Francis' book on uh, tinkering with early automobiles, it's about the women tinkering with their automobiles to uh, enhance them, to give them more value. And the list goes on, right? It's, it's like um, if you, you had seen the word tinkering been used in a uh, description of the, the work of Daphne Oram, for instance, it would make a lot of sense in that kind of, in, in the actual <laughs> material, mm -hmm. ma material procedures involved in it. So the, the social, the cultural connotations um, might be a problem. But I think in terms of, of uh, the usefulness of the word, um, that's good. So, so in terms of its application in the 21st century, or in, a, in I guess I would say in a computer <laughs> uh, software kind of setting, because, well, I'm, I'm interested to, to, to hear what, what you're thinking about. Like, um, there's a lot of <laughs> tinkering um, with uh, microprocessors, like um, mm. actual uh, components in uh, electronics. That's mm. the word used in maker culture and DIY, etc. But there's <laughs> some of the same connotations, I guess, with uh, physical uh, playing with stuff. <laughs> so, so how that's different for you then? than in a music production setting in a DAW, for instance. Yeah, I, mean, I think for me, I think you're right. It's, it's a term, I think also it's a term that's used in different social worlds. And so I'm interested in how, you know, users, is it a concept that they're using to describe their own practice? Yeah. Uh, is it something that can be identified as tinkerers? 
I guess I'm kind of thinking about how we use concepts within academia yeah. and, wh and whether those concepts come from the data um, or whether you know, we're taking those terms and imposing them on the participants of our research. And if we are, do we have to be careful about yeah. how, you know, so it, it may work in EDM music, but does it work in, in hip hop? I think, you know, it's kind of treating those musical worlds as having different sets of practices, different sets of cultural traditions. Yeah, um, so, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's uh, interesting. Yeah, I think so. Um, but still, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting how you frame that with um, where we get our concepts from, right? Yeah. Because um, clinging to this idea that we should use terms that they use themselves is not necessarily the way to go, uh, in my opinion. And also depends on language stuff, uh, etc. So noodling mm -hmm. <laughs> is perhaps uh, closer to how the Norwegians described it as well. I'm, uh -huh. I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, I try to ch check our transcripts, and um, some of them use the word flick, flicke, and that's basically quite applicable to <laughs> to uh, tinkering. Yeah. So just to uh, uh, very briefly. Um, justify my use of tinkering <laughs> in that setting is at least what I'm trying to do or what, how I'm thinking about it myself is there's some other terms describing the procedures or, mm -hmm. or the kind of um, procedural uh, procedures in yeah. DAWs, right? Uh -huh. Where you have a, a different way of iteration, iter rapid iteration, right? Prototyping of ideas is Curtis Rhodes, computer music guy. He uses that term. And um, Adam Bell and colleagues describe it as exploratory sequencing, right? So sequencing is a word that has the right kind of <laughs> um, associations, right? Mm -hmm. And then exploratory is. But for me, that's not the same as, as the... For me, it's, it's almost material, right? Even yeah. though it's in a virtual space. Yeah. And then Mike uses the word procedural listening which is also very relevant to the practices I'm describing, but also slightly different in terms of what it invites of, of depth of, of the kind of um, um, materialist <laughs> perspective. Uh -huh. Because uh, I didn't get to that in, in this. So these are articles that kind of try to establish this view as how I look at them. So obviously following from the 80s into the 21st century, I would yeah. have to open the black box. Right? I would have to see how, like uh, in Lin's, Roger Lin's case, he actually uh, tinkered with the memory. Right? Yeah. We don't do that anymore, even though we tinker with time. But still, uh, the physical memory inside of the machine shifts whenever you move around. It's like the binary matrix screen of numbers, it's uh, so complicated that we can't really yeah. fathom it, but, but it also ha always has this material consequence when you do something in a DAW. So, so that's, I guess, I, I can't... So I, I might be too uh, attached to my concept once more. Like, I, I really want to address this deeper, yeah. Yeah. Um, the layered materiality of the process, I yeah. guess. But, but it, it might not work as... A, as a term, regardless if people don't, I, I might have to justify it. But <laughs> do you think it makes more sense to distinguish them from other terms? I, yeah, I, mean, I think that would make sense to kind of look at it a, along with the terminology of the language that people are using to describe music. I mean, I think the Daphne Ram example is a very good one, I think, to think about how she was working with those synthesizers, going back to the kind of music concrete era, uh, that seems kind of like a useful way of describing those practices. I think the reason why I'm asking is it, is it in some way better suited to pre-digital practices again comes back to the, the way of working in, in hip-hop culture. Oh, yeah. Perhaps with the DW being so much focused around the idea of precision around the digital. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, whether tinkering therefore is relevant to certain practices. Uh, both historically, but also kind of across, across genres. 
Um, but yeah, I think those are ideas that I maybe just you know, I want you to probably just see, you know, will they help you refine this idea of tinkering? I think this is partly going back to process as well. Um, in terms of kind of comments on a thesis, then obviously they're in, you know, like comments from a journal editor. You know, they're encouraged, encouraging you just to kind of think about how this concept might work across different musical worlds and uh, you know, whether it fits hip hop in the same way that fits kind of <coughs> EDM. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I do it. Uh, yeah, I really agree that it's something to consider <laughs> closely how it works, and I, um, I guess I'm at that point where does this take me further or do I have to um, be more specific, yeah. historical oh. specificity, as you said. Yeah. But in terms of the um, um, usefulness for hip hop, uh, I'm not really sure that I, I've think, been thinking about this. And so hip hop is a lot of things. <laughs> that's that's uh, my first thought in terms of the procedures or the, the prax practice, basically, there's a lot of overlap, mm -hmm. in, I'd say. Um, but even when it's not, uh, in terms of the, the, the way they use samples, for instance, um, in sample-based hip-hop, which is less um, dominating <laughs> these days, but uh, an important and very hip hop, hip hop y um, uh, kind of music and production style. Mm -hmm. I think, so, so for me, again, I might be too close to these concepts myself, but I think the coupling of time and tinkering um, makes it really ac applicable to hip hop music, yeah. as I referenced earlier, this idea of. of sampling complex sounds that already have a rhythmic fabric yeah. and recontextualizing it is yeah. very much the, the grid <laughs> becomes very much spatial yeah and um, positioning and yeah it's very much yeah yeah and I, I know you're working on a project about hip-hop at the moment so I'll, I'll be interested to see how you know the idea of tinkering is applicable to that research as, as it develops um, cool I better move on to the <laughs> the second concept, um, in the interest of time, um, and that is the one of machine rhythm. Yeah. Um, so in the introduction, you write that machine rhythm is here understood to be sounds ordered in musically meaningful patterns that are encoded in and performed by some kind of technological device. So when I read that, I thought, great, but I thought, isn't that all music? Um, <laughs> you know, um, could the human be described as a rhythm producing machine? Is the drum kit a rhythm producing machine? Um, or are you referring specifically to digitally based instruments that you refer to in the thesis, such as LINS, uh, LM1, uh, that can be used specifically to program rhythms? So yeah, my kind of initial thought was, is this just a little bit too broad? Um, again, does it need to be more specific to relate to the machine rhythms of medieval times compared to the machine rhythms that you kind of focus on in relation to EDM. Yeah. Yeah, that's also um, an important question. Um, so that, that's something that I did think a lot about. <laughs> so being very influenced by uh, uh, Anna's last uh, rhythm project, which you were a part of as well. Uh, where rhythm is musical rhythm in, in the age of digital reproduction, right? That's, um, that's where all this started. But then uh, my <laughs> historical endeavors <laughs> introduced me to all of this. You said digital, and, and that's what they are, right? It's, it's digital. They are programmed, these um, old automatons, these early robots. So it, in fact, the first programmable robot was a musical instrument. Um, so anything <laughs> that can be programmed, I'd say, becomes uh, able to, to produce machine rhythm. So that's why I zoomed out and, or, or generalized it that much in, in order to encompass both things. The human, I'm not, 
No, <laughs> that's more complicated. But for instance, there's, um, yeah, one of the first, well, I guess I think it's the first programmable robot is um, a flute um, that is operated uh, with a, sin uh, um, a clam, a clam wheel, right? And uh, water driven. The point is, it's the same, it's spatialization yeah. <laughs> and it's a program and uh, patterns in space. Yeah. So maybe uh, that's a way of specifying it more. It's just about yeah. the programmable part of it. But then again, um, no, yeah, I guess that's uh, something I might <laughs> specify more. Yeah, I mean, I, to, I, mean, I think the cylinder, this, you know, the cylinder and the history of that is, is fascinating. You know, I think just that long historical frame is really useful. Um, and you kind of reference Telef Clifter's work as well, which I think is important in terms of how we conceptualize the digital. Yeah. So we, you know, we can think of this as a digital instrument. Yeah, he's, well, um, I should have mentioned him when we talk about uh, meetings and coincidences, yeah. because okay. that's probably the most important influence in terms of uh, notational systems. Yeah. He really framed my whole idea on that. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so certainly you'll, as an on and off type instrument, you know, he mentions in his articles, you know, Morse code being as a form of, of digital technology. So to come back to that, the article on grids and machine rhythms, um, the way you historicize machine rhythm, you kind of do that in sort of three eras. You talk about the mechanical era, the electrical era, and the digital era. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I, know, I might be painting with two broad brush strokes, so correct me if I am. And I, th I think this works well as a way of writing musical history. But then you bring the Roland TR-808 into the discussion on the section on drum machines. Um, and at that point, I began to think about, you know, what you might call what Jonathan Stern calls the entanglement of the analog and the digital, mm. um, certainly in the design of synthesizers and the 80s. So again, I'm wondering, is that periodization just a little bit too neat? And it then kind of brought me back to your idea of evading the grid. You know, and you spoke in your lecture about the homogenizing effects of the grid. Um, so when I interviewed um, a musician back in 2008 uh, for my own thesis, he spoke about an artist called Jamie Liddell, Jamie Liddell, um, and how, if I can quote, the reason he got out of the super collider stuff was because he was sitting moving little colored blocks on whatever program he was using. This isn't music making, mm. okay? So it's a real kind of idea of authenticity running through what music making is in his ideology. So al along with many other producers, um, this musician, Ziggy Campbell, now makes music using Eurorack synthesizers. Um, in Edinburgh, there are scenes, micro scenes, based around Eurorack synthesizers. I'm supervising a PhD about an ethnography of Edinburgh's Eurorack scene. So when I was reading your thesis, I'm kind of very interested about what the, the paradigm of the grid means for um, working out what's happening with Eurorack and kind of what the ubiquity of the grid means then for the study of popular music. Um, so, you know, are, in your kind of, you know, in terms of your research, are, are you finding that producers, musicians are trying to evade the grid? You know, I mean, that, you know, 2008, 15 years ago, clearly there's been something going on over the last decade where producers are finding the grid too restrictive and trying to kind of break away from that. Yeah. And Eurorack seems to be a kind of pretty good way in which, you know, I wouldn't describe it as the revenge of the analog because the analog, you know, often the popularity of vinyl is described as the revenge of the analog um, because the analog has never really gone away. It's always been entangled with the sure. digital. Um, so yeah, I'm curious if you, as you've got any thoughts on that way that producers are trying to evade the grid. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so that's, um, yeah, it's a great point, actually. You're mentioning the TR-808. So, well, <laughs> that's interesting because um, uh, I, I remember So, there are drum machines that produce analog sounds, synthesized sounds, 
and then there are uh, drum machines that produce sampled sounds, but still like one hit samples. So in terms of the rhythms, it's quite similar, but the synthesized sound invites a more uh, rigid uh, mechanical uh, pulse, for sure. Um, but what's interesting about the TRA-808 is that it, it arrives at a moment where the sequencers inside is made of this uh, early digital components, right? So the sounds are synthesized, but, but the grid is digital. Um, <laughs> so that, that's a lot of the fetishizing of, of analog technologies missed that point that we, we talk about analog stump boxes for guitarists, for instance. And, and inside them, there's so often digital components, right? But it's packaged in a way that feels like in, Nor uh, po uh, po Nor uh, in Norwegian, <laughs> we say uh, that analog or uh, non-digital stuff um, moves the air, right? It feels right. Um, but then again, uh, it is only par partially <laughs> authentic as such uh, um, because of the uh, digital discrete, let's, let's call it discrete components, right? Because mm -hmm. the sequencer itself is uh, basically the same as in um, uh, the CR, um, CR78, uh, which use samples. And um, another interesting thing there is just to f uh, finish that point is that uh, Roland chose to limit the grid on the TR-808 because they had a step sequence layout, right? They had a, um, 16 steps mapped in groups of four. It invited a real four, four force uh, time signature, rigid <laughs> mechanical, yeah. It took back the good old associations with the machine rhythm that it, it tried to, to kind of rival uh, Lin's real drums. Mm -hmm. Slogan, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, they were at that time able to make more micro rhythmical, or uh, basically it's about the, the resolution of the sequencer, right? And they uh, restricted it to only 16 steps with no uh, wriggle room, <laughs> micro rhythmic uh, nuances. But then, uh, already in their next the TR. 707, I'm not sure, uh, or maybe the third generation of those kind of step sequencers, you had the ability to shuffle sounds in milliseconds back in, on and off the grid. Mm -hmm. So that's just to answer your broader question uh, quickly. That's something uh, I found interesting is um, whenever people use step sequencers, like in a like one of the uh, producers we interviewed, Per Martinson, Mental Overdrive. He uses a doorless setup because he wants to get away from all that and he's a guy in his uh, 50s. <laughs> 50s, I think. And he's reminiscing. So he used to produce in a DAW, he told us, like five years ago, and now he's all doorless again. And enjoying that uh, a lot, as many do. Mm -hmm. My point is <laughs> that um, we analyzed his music and we talked to him, and um, he, he, he sequences his music on a fixed step sequencer, but then he uses uh, offset parameters right, on the steps. Like on this voice in my sequence, the snare drum would be 10 milliseconds late on every fourth step in the sequence, etc. But then the visual feedback is on the grid, right? So just observing someone produce like that, especially when it's subtle, we still think they are oh, purely rigid on beat all the way. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, I think uh, people tinker with the placement of sounds, yeah. even though it's in an analog, analog <laughs> yeah. context, right? Yeah. Thanks. We're kind of running out of time a little bit, oh, yeah. and I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to 
continuing the discussion perhaps more informally uh, <laughs> tonight um, sure. in the future, but I mean, thank you for taking the time to focus on the process, on the development of the concepts. Um, perhaps I can just end um, by asking a little bit about kind of where, where you go next with this research. Um, I kind of, dare I say, innovative research. Uh, if, uh, you know, I don't want to kind of go against Edgerton's um, argument against innovation uh, type of histories. But I think, you know, in the way that you bring together media archaeology and musical, musicological analysis, then I think it is, is innovative. Um, but yeah, I'm interested in whether you'll be, you know, Latour comes into um, that initial document, you know, you, the, the rule of method about black boxes, which I kind of found fascinating in terms of getting into the black box before they're closed. Um, so yeah, curious as to whether you'll kind of continue to follow the actors. You know, that's his other guess, the other rule of method, follow the actors. Uh, you kind of make this distinction between tinkering and tinkerers, which I'm a bit skeptical about. I think, oh, okay. can the two be, be uh, separated? I'm not sure. So will you follow the tinkerers or will you follow the instruments? Um, you know, there's kind of obviously a lot of opportunity here to contribute to the new field of critical uh, organology. Will your research become more ethnographic? Uh, mm. I think you kind of hint at that. Um, you know, again, going back to the listeners, um, you know, we're kind of left tantalizingly like, close to, you know, what do the listeners think? But they, they don't feature, I'm kind of thinking, well, for something to be a kind of ethnographic study, we need to kind of treat music as a culture. Um, will you end up on the dance floor? Uh, will you tell us more about the dance floor experiences of EDM, either as, a, as an observer or a participant? I think, you know, for ethnography, we need that kind of rich data. So, mm. again, perhaps that's something we can talk about later. Sure, yeah. Along with whether Howland will score against Scotland on Saturday. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think we've only got a couple of minutes, but maybe just time to to wrap things up before uh, Mike will kind of continue with the yeah. second. So uh, 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 there's time for a short answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, great question. And um, what I picked up on that was really this distinguishing between tinkerers and tinkering and instruments and uh, actors, right? And I, um, I guess uh, I risk, my, my gut tells me that I have more to say about the instruments, right? Um, but that it requires either a, a full engagement with the, the social technical thing about one case instead of this kind of overarching thing I'm doing here, I think, because uh, I've, I've reached a kind of limit to, to how superficial I can be. In that sense, um, in my opinion, it's, it's definitely possible to only describe <laughs> the machinery. And, uh, but then again, it's so connected with practices of the tinkerer, like mm -hmm. I said, in the, like Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, and early Xerox developments and bootstrapping. It's, it's uh, impossible to write that kind of histories of mm -hmm. digital technologies without the tinkerers. So. Yeah. So that leads me into a more, I guess, ethnographic, but with some kind of uh, organizing concept, <laughs> which is grids, <laughs> no, yes. a specialization of time, I guess. Might be interesting to, to find some actors and really dig into how they did stuff. Yeah. That's a yeah. short answer to a yeah. good question. With, Continue. Yeah. Apologies if I've asked you too many questions, but I'll kind of look forward to, yeah, continuing the conversation. Yeah, yeah, uh, I've really much enjoyed the dialogue. Um, I've enjoyed engaging with your work, and I look forward to seeing how it develops. So, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much for interesting and engaging discussions. Uh, we will take a break and reconvene at uh, 2.15.
Uh, I now call upon uh, a second opponent, Professor uh, Mike Derrico, to come forward, please. Check, check, that's on, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the invite. This has been, it's always a pleasure. I feel like, you know, last time I was here three years ago, um, it was a very different time, of course, but, um, but it's, it's, it's great to be back here. Um, I'm gonna start sort of with the strengths I see and then we'll get right into questions, but, um, but yeah, this was a real joy to read and, and just a pleasure listening to you talk through the trial lecture and everything. I think, uh, you know, one of my, maybe the highlight moment was when you described Burger King menu as a grid of weird burgers. Uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, when I started, uh, you know, when I started graduate school, um, I remember thinking how difficult it would be to find people who did this type of work, who studied digital audio software and, you know, um, studying music production in such a deep way. Uh, and then, you know, in 2012, I remember meeting Professor Danielson at the Art of Record Production Conference and learning about all the great stuff that was happening here even before RITMO. Um, and so I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like since then I've kind of considered many of the folks in this group part of my academic home base, I guess, if you will. Um, so it was, a, it was a pleasure to read this document, you know, not just as a document, but also part of, you know, an ongoing intellectual uh, discourse that I feel like we've shared through conferences and um, in general academic engagement for the past few years. Um, I think one of the major strengths I saw of this, of, of, of the work, is that uh, the dissertation really pinpoints the fundamental biases uh, and methodological approaches uh, of existing research in the field of software studies, media archaeology, uh, and studies in the art of record production. Um, the, the historical framing uh, that you presented in the first essay, I think, is a really, uh, real testament to your awareness of existing literature and your confidence in engaging with it, uh, more importantly. Uh, the argument about the connection between, for example, Ableton's arrangement view and pre-technical writing as establishing a core argument against skeuomorphic design and software uh, was such a nuanced and poignant critique, I feel like, not only of my own work, um, but it was also a great way to kind of move software studies uh, and music production studies into new directions. Um, I think the incorporation of, in, um, in your analysis of project stems from DAWs uh, with ethnomusicological and music theoretical perspectives introduces a fresh perspective on software studies and pop music studies. Uh, the graphic examples presented uh, throughout the document added so much to your, own, to your arguments and the narrative through line uh, that you're telling. Um, I, I appreciated especially the transcriptions and analytical figures provided in part two. Uh, those two, I think like those two, two sections did a great job of that. Um, as well as how the two essays, essays three and four in part two, provided complementary kind of producer and listener perspective. Um, and then finally, I would just say that the, uh, the amount of peer-reviewed work uh, and research collaborations that you did uh, leading up to the defense is laudable, especially, you know, just to say, to, for someone raising young kids and through a global pandemic. Uh, so, so congratulations on that as well. Um, and of course, now we're in the final stretch, so hopefully, you know, um, I can ask you especially difficult questions oh. <laughs> now that you're sufficiently tired and <laughs> exhausted. Um, but one of the first questions that I really wanted to get at uh, kind of bounces off what you and Paul were just leaving with about this ethnomusicological perspective, right? Um, and it's about your claim of being a scholar practitioner. Yeah. Because of course nowadays I think that's become a very common thing to say, right? Um, and, and I'm not questioning your perspective, as that's not the question here, but, um, but that's become a very common thing nowadays, but, it, but I think it also goes back to core questions about our stance, our perspective, and where we come from, and I think specifically in the field of ethnomusicology, right? The, the discipline was really founded on these questions of emic and edic perspectives, that is like insider versus outsider perspectives, as well as the question of bimusicality, right? The idea that if you wanted to understand a musical culture you had to learn, you had to be a maker in it, right? You had to learn the instrument. Um, and I think this is also related to how, uh, another thing that, that, that Paul had hinted at is, is how you're going to develop your authorial voice in your writing in general. Um, so the question is kind of two parts um, related to that scholar-practitioner 
perspective, right? The first is, is kind of what brought you to these research questions and did this come from the sort of scholarly influences, the community of scholars around you, or did it come from your practical tinkering with the software and the technologies you're addressing? And the second, to build off that, is, is what did this scholar practitioner perspective provide that you, for you in terms of the insights that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise? Um, because I felt like aside from SA3 a little bit, um, I don't feel that, the, that, that your perspective as a practitioner was was represented fully, you know, so, so that those are the, the kind of two parts to that, to that question. Yeah, great. Great questions. Um, it's just, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Well, um, as you said, it's, it's one of those things. Uh, I, I actually felt that I've, should should include it if you know what I mean. It, it was it, it is as you say something that one does <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because everyone that uh, studies these kinds of things noodle <laughs> noodle with these technologies at some level. So I guess it's it's um, I'm, I'm not saying it's an imperative to to kind of uh, bring that into it, um, but I'm kind of somewhat agnostic to, to whether it's a useful thing. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, first, first of all. It's useful when you're a true practitioner, like um, uh, one of our co-authors, Jon Marius Oershol Drekke. He, he has been in, in industry, let's say, and comes to academia from that side and brings really valuable insights. Um, that are different because he, he brings into not, not just having used the tools, but been in the industry or in the social, sociocultural context as well, which is really important, I think. Um, but in, in my case, I still find it um, applies in a really important sense because uh, going back to the, the kind of conceptual orientation um, to time, I think I, I wouldn't have arrived at that uh, had I not been using these tools for so many years myself. Like when we interviewed um, Mental Overdrive, who used these step sequencers, analog setup. Um, I, I, I knew what he meant when he talked about offsetting and, and nudging uh, sounds on and off the grid, even though he described a step sequencer, let's say. So in terms of knowledge about the interiors mm. <laughs> of the production culture, it's, it's ob obvious, I think. But whether we should b brag about it or if it's useful in that sense, I'm not sure. Um, so I guess that answers the second question par partly as well, because um, uh, it would, would have been, I can't imagine how it would be if I didn't spend all of those yeah, yeah. years. For instance, I, I, I grew up with a brother that produced trance music in trackers. And then uh, that, that's how I started as well. So even though it didn't make, make the thesis, that's uh, a very much a, f a framework. A tracker sequencers are, are like a spreadsheet with a nu numerical inputs. So, so that's something that I um, correlate with MIDI, for instance, intuitively, because I've used it. So that's mm -hmm. just one example of how being... So for me, it, it's, a, it's a distingu distinguishing between professional or, or not, right? So even though I, I can't really, in any useful sense, say that I have been a pr practitioner in a professional or... It, um, yeah, professional <coughs> sense. It's been absolutely formative to my perspectives and how I see things, and it wouldn't have been possible without them, I think. So I guess my answer is, I'm not sh too sure about the, the concept or the term, but... Yeah, yeah. no, that's fine. I think it's, it's good that you acknowledge, like yeah. It, it, uh, yeah, it didn't have to be a, an important part of the insights necessarily, but I, I do think it's important that you, that you recognize 
what you said, like the pressure of <laughs> including yeah. it, because I think that just professionally moving forward, it's going to be something that will you yeah, know, carry true. you yeah. carry Maybe far I, with, you know, wherever you go, wherever you decide to go next. I think yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a big thing that people want to see out of a, a teacher or a definitely researcher. Yeah. Um, it, the, the next question is is related to that, but it's it, it's about audience. Um, so, so with the with the rise of organizations like the Art of Record Production and now the uh, Society for Music Production Research, uh, the conversations that we have, that academics and practitioners have within this field, right, this emerging field, range from extremely technical, as you know, you know extremely technical to very broad, kind of more social, uh, sociocultural elements of music production. Um, so, for for your work, or for this document specifically, or in general in your own work, uh, who do you see as the main audience, and how do you balance all these different perspectives? Right. Um, yeah. The, the the very technical side of the things you're talking about with the more broader kind of public facing things. The second um, the second part of that would be what what might practitioners gain from your thesis. Uh, versus what would be the major takeaway for musicologists or media theorists, for example? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I guess my answer to both of them kind of intersects, or my thinking about uh, these intersects, because I feel my contribution is, is in neither group, <laughs> in a way. It's, it's in, in, um, in this in-between space, or below, or behind, or something, <laughs> mm -hmm. in terms of this media materialism aspect, which is, to me, at least, the real contribution um, so, so I do describe a history of this, uh, ac these uh, actual instruments, uh, but what I try to do is narrate this, this more, um, this, what's the, um, par paradigmatic forms like, uh, like the grid, how it quietly constitute what we think of <laughs> as music in the first place, uh, or as Thai rhythm in the first place. That said, I do think that the more technically inclined people would understand it better, or not better, that's a bad word, but uh, grasp the concepts easier uh, in the current format. So it would be a fun challenge, I think, to kind of try to convey <laughs> that same idea that take the grid or specialization of time and notational systems uh, governs how we think about rhythm to begin with for a more broader um, so group of sociologists would be interested in the materiality of uh, and how it maps and connects with society right and uh, culture broadly but that's not really not what uh, not really uh, something that I've achieved yet I think but Mm. Perhaps something that, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge, but also interesting to me. It's really hard to convey these concepts to <laughs> to my wife, <laughs> for instance. <laughs> so, so I I want to rehearse that that and, and try to refine it in a way that because it should be able to to do that, right? It's just about Notation, right? Yeah, but it's yeah. hard, nevertheless. So. Yeah, I don't know if that answers. Yeah, totally. It's, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's a similar. When I told my six-year-old I was coming to a dissertation defense, yeah. I said, "What is a dissertation <laughs> defense? And sure. How do you convey that?" <laughs> um, You're an attack. I guess it, this is a, a sort of a side thing, but related. Uh, I don't know if you have a sense of this, but how has your work been received, like through conferences and or through journal articles? Do you have a sense of how? Folks from different disciplines have received it uh, yet, or well, yeah, in part. But uh, <laughs> the two the two parts of the project complicates that definitely because we presented the work in two 
mm -hmm. I've, I've been a part of presenting the time project outputs, uh, which is something very different from the other uh, part, but still in the same avenues, right? Like, like on um, art of record production context or innovation in music, both are highly applicable, but mm. but the time stuff we've, we've done um, also in, in uh, like rhythm perception um, conferences and rhythm studies, more general, uh, which is uh, not aligned with a uh, music technologist <laughs> perspectives on this. So it's, it's been interesting, I'd say, yeah. to talk about this in so different audiences. And then uh, I, I definitely have, have left parts of it out both ways, let's say. The, the real nerding out on microrhythm is left out of my talk on waveforms, for instance and vice versa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's been interesting, I, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, just because it's such, I asked it because it's such an important time where you're finishing up a major yeah. project and you have a lot of supervisors and external evaluators uh, telling you things of where you should or shouldn't go with it, or, <laughs> or maybe you don't have that. I, I know for my own defense, it was sort of like you go around the table and the ethnomusicologist says, you need more ethnomusicology. <laughs> the design person says you need more design. Yeah. And it, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Um, so this next question is, is kind of building on another one of these things that you and Paul started to talk about, um, about, about the choice of um, case studies. Um, so specifically, w I'm asking, could you describe the biases, challenges, and implicit assumptions that came from working with Norwegian EDM producers, but specifically, like, the specific informants that you chose to work with, too? Um, because I think, you know, w while EDM represents kind of the apex of musical globalization in a, in a lot of ways, right, um, its communities are still very hyper-localized. And so, um, so how do your informants view themselves in terms of this dichotomy between their global musical reach and influence and their local space within Norway? Um, I thought of this specifically because when you were giving your lecture, um, you, you mentioned Jameson's idea about how lo the local becomes mm. gone, right? In in post modern uh, in po post modernity. So so what is yeah? If you could speak to that 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 um, local global relationship in terms of your work with uh, your EDM kind of informants. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, interesting uh, to kind of review <laughs> uh, in retrospect. I think. So we chose them, uh, I guess, the, the uh, primary, um, what's, it's getting here, yeah. <laughs> it's been a long day. The primary, uh, uh, the, the first thing we thought of to, to kind of choose them and distinguish between them or, or to uh, make sure they represented what we wanted was um, subgenre. Um, connections, right? Or, or so we we uh, wanted a some kind of uh, house techno alibi <laughs> with more rigid. On we were interested in in rhythm, right? So there's different rhythmic profiles in EDM. So we were really guided by that, I think, mm. initially. So. Um, despite how it might look from, from the outside, so from the outside, or not the outside, but some would have the, the first, first impression would be like uh, we interviewed Sieb, which is um, a, a very internationally acknowledged, uh, very commercial pop duo that had a, a monster hit, like the second most streamed song on Spotify in 2018 or something like that. So, so they represent like the global <laughs> commercialized. But, but for us, they represent a tropical house, right? They represented mm. a style of EDM that had a peculiar rhythmic feel to it and tempo that was slightly slower and it was swingy and interesting. Um, and um, yeah, 
techno and tropical house. And then we had um, uh, another up and coming uh, duo of producers that uh, makes electro pop, which is <laughs> slightly different in rhythmic profiles, let's say. So that, that was our uh, uh, orienting principle, I think, in, from what I remember. And also, it's, it's coincidences also, right? It's who you get or who you uh, know someone who knows someone who knows someone <laughs> and can get you in contact with. Where Jon Marius uh, being a connected man was important, right? And Norway is a small country. It's an even smaller EDM milieu. <laughs> but uh, we had a, a several, two of the producers were from far north in Norway. That counts for something, <laughs> diversity. <laughs> But it does because there are localized like milieus. These were the techno, uh, Charlotte Bendix and Per Martinsen, from both two different generations, but from nor northern Norway. Like Reiksop also mm -hmm. is one of the acts. From yeah, right. But but for the bigger artists like Sieb, yeah. you know, do they still see a strong connection to their Norwegian roots, or is this is it more like they're kind of in the industry and yeah, you know. Yes, so, so that's the other part of it. Um, I, I don't think any of them... Well, Per Martinsen uh, probably feels some kind of allegiance to a Norwegian techno mm -hmm. scene, right? There's like the Nordic... Uh, like the windy, <laughs> uh, rainy mood, like, um, uh, like crime, noir, yeah, yeah, right. Nordic crime. Like a dark techno. Yeah, yeah like... Uh, in some of his work, at least. Mm -hmm. That's, um, and, and also, he was part of this um, establishment of techno music in Norway back in the 80s, right? So we had some kind of uh, roots in that. So I, I guess we wanted to represent the whole spectrum of what, what is possible to represent in Norway, let's say, <laughs> which is a new generation, an old generation, different uh, local uh, areas. But it's interesting how, how it, I can rationalize all that I want about it now. But I think the main thing was the rhythmic profiles and, yeah. and uh, making sure we, we didn't only interview uh, male, white guys in their 40s mm -hmm. in Oslo. Yeah, <laughs> right. Great, yeah, appreciate that. Uh, this next one has sort of a big framing, so I'll try to highlight with the actual questions. <laughs> okay. But it's more about the sort of literature and STS, uh, STS literature. Um, on page eight, you mentioned uh, you developed the con conceptual framework of time tinkering to address both sides of the concept of machine groove. While there is always a technology governing the possibilities and constraints of creative operations of machine timing, these operations are intrinsically related to human agency and practice. Right? So this you know, user, designer, developer, right, user, developer, binary or approach, right, is, is at the heart of the sort of social construction of technology approach of STS. Um, but I think um, it, it, to follow this, right, you also claim that the approach seeks to primarily describe the practices of time tinkering, not the role of tinkers as such, which you kind of address with Paul a bit. But my thing with, with the Scott approaches, the right, social construction pr approaches is that often they end up either focusing on designers or end users, right? Mm. Um, but especially in the world of music tech, we have all these, you know, what Timothy Taylor calls cultural intermediaries um, that he argues are even more important than either of these, <laughs> the users or the designers. And so I'm thinking he, within tech, right, we have product managers at Ableton who are regionally situated around the world who try to get people to buy in, who try to get users and teachers and educators and scholars to buy into the software, right, as a marketing tool, or brand managers um, at these companies, right, um, or the sort of, um, you know, just curators in general, curators of these technology, people like Peter Kern, you know, bloggers who kind of act as liaisons between users and developers. Yeah. So um, where, do you, where do these stakeholders fit in your own work? 
<laughs> that's, uh, I haven't thought about that, but that's interesting. And uh, of course, yeah, I've, I've also noticed how, even though the Scott approach applies to all of these, uh, it tends, to, but, but then again, it's, it's about, <laughs> that's where the most, typically it, it hasn't been done uh, that kind of work on that kind of instrument. That's where we start, right? It's, it's a good place to start. It doesn't make sense to start with a curator. It, it does make sense, but it's not um, something that uh, people tend to start with. <laughs> that's right. my point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one, um, one thing. But then also, um, you, you, are, you, you are describing other uh, methodologies in, in, uh, in uh, SDS, right? Actor networks and, and how, how it all. So that's one approach to this, is, is to kind of try to, to flatten out a bit <laughs> um, and see how it all maps together and, 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 um, and or, or, yeah, just acknowledge that <laughs> you can't reduce it to any, that, 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 that's a different, um, the poten potential for analysis is different once you narrow it down, right? And acknowledging that is, uh, something that this, the Scott milieu has been uh, bed, um, developing, for sure, mm -hmm. uh, in the um, How Users Matter anthology, they address this um, problem, <laughs> let's say, uh, of the binary. But then again, I, I do find the other approaches more fruitful for, for this kind of broad, or, or trying to address other stakeholders, for sure. Mm -hmm. But that's not your question, really. Uh, I guess my answer to how I would think about those stakeholders is I, I don't yet uh, because I'm so invested in this concept <laughs> yeah. once more, right? I want to talk about the grid. I'm not that interested in... I, I am interested in them, for sure. And, and now I'm interested in, in even more stakeholders after your question, right? Because <laughs> that's how it works. Yeah. So, oh, I hadn't thought about the curators. Yeah. But uh, mapping those kind of, um, it's, it's further away from the grid, let's say. <laughs> but still important to acknowledge, I think. And would be super interesting if it could add something really valuable, right? Yeah. Like I saw, I saw a presentation once from one who, who uh, didn't, ethnography on um, backstage workers solely and how they uh, held it all together <laughs> in the music industry, which is kind of uh, looking at it sideways or um, finding those stakeholders is interesting. I, ha I haven't really put a lot of thought in it yet in terms of this uh, organizing principle of, of the grid for me, yeah. but, but sure. Yeah, I'll yeah. put some more thinking into that. Interesting. I, I mean, I guess, yeah, in some ways it's, it becomes more of a music education project, but I'm, I think about how people like Dennis DeSantis at Ableton or like there a lot of these com software companies are developing like learning yeah. um, teams, right, to develop basically things to help people learn how to use their software, yeah, and right. those end up becoming very important in terms of how people tinker with the tools, right? That's, so that's a just, really yeah. good point, yeah. Yeah, an interesting area to think about. Because it just, um, that resonated really with me because I, I've been thinking more about teaching, right? And, mm. and teaching production, for me, provides an opportunity to kind of address, address this um, blind spot people have to how uh, the grid actually works. So this link to, uh, like, the, Hitler and uh, the German media uh, theorist talks about the return of the symbolic, right? And, and writing, writing is at the fore again. Digital technologies, like I said about the silence, the, the role of silence in a sequencer is more aligned with a, it's a thinking tool in a spatial sense now to, to organize sounds in space, right? 
yeah. which operationalizes the breaks or the, the emptiness between clips in a different, uh, it's a whole, whole different paradigm from uh, all past recording uh, technologies. But it's so familiar to us because we've been writing on, it's writing, right, basically. Yeah, right. Or it's, uh, um, yeah. So, so to bring that into a musical educational context, to kind of show people that, I find interesting. So one of the only um, outreach, is that, a, yeah, that yeah. makes sense to you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Articles uh, that I'm really satisfied with is, is one that I try to describe how the waveform shapes the visualization of sound, shapes how we think about sound to begin with and how it can be used, and et cetera. So trying to kind of communicate that in a learning or education setting. It's really yeah. interesting. I mean, it, it kind of sounds like, you know, you're talking about music theory, right? Like, I mean, it yeah. makes sense that you yeah, yeah, yeah. publish in the music theory um, journal, but, but that seems maybe a, a, a really useful audience to uh, articulate these things. You're, you're kind of talking about how the grid um, creates an, a new music theory for yeah. electronic musicians. Like right? Santos and when they use the, the grid instead of uh, traditional notation, right? Right, right, yeah. Just and melodics, where you learn mm. to play with uh, the grid instead of notes, and, like yeah, just new right. platforms. For, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and the, their stakeholders outside of the tinkerers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that are relevant for the grid, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, edu and music technology education would involve a whole other range of stakeholders as well. Definitely, um, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is kind of getting uh, getting back to uh, to the EDM case studies. Um, so you focus on EDM genres for the case studies, right? And that makes sense because um, you mentioned on page five that these these genres are quote often associated with grid and machine rhythms, right? Uh, indeed, EDM and hip hop are often the go-to genres for musicologists discussing technological innovation um, and evolution. But I think uh, there's a sort of argument, you know, it could be argued that EDM is maybe a bit obvious of a choice for case studies in a project like this, right? Because the insights are so innately, uh, arguably, so innately present in the, you know, in the musical styles and technical practices of the artist. Um, so I guess the, the big question is, do you see your, or how do you see your main, your main research insights about grid-based technological tinkering, applying to other musical genres like film or video game music, or rock or metal, uh, or even classical, because you know, similar software and even practices of technological tink tinkering in some cases are often present nowadays in those genres as well, albeit not in a, as, maybe as transparent a manner. Yeah. So do you see your, this research as transferable to other genres, or do you see similar kind of yeah. practices happening? Yeah, that's uh, actually... I ha haven't uh, th thought a lot about it when listening to you now. I, I instantly see the potential, uh, actually. Especially, as you say, because uh, uh, EDM and, and hip hop production is, is quite obvious. And, and also, uh, it, it invites this critical perspective where you, you kind of go back and forth between developers and users, right? Because um, I remember you talked about this and the muddy rhythms thing where the humanizing <laughs> uh, plugins from developers kind of mimic the way that humans <laughs> um, utilize the grid. Not, not so hyper, hyper uh, quantization or something you call it. So, so uh, even, even when really, really adhering to the grid, there's some kind of back and forth in, in the way that it's, it's the user's framing of it that it gets back. <laughs> as a, so it's a back and forth thing. Um, but in other genres, that's, that's what I was thinking about. Uh, like in classical music, for instance, you don't apply quantization, right? But you do a lot of edits, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's... Uh, and podcasting or vo voiceovers. I've done some work in that area. 
And uh, that, that's the clearest case of working with waveform represented audio without needing to listen to it, right? It's, it's voice, it's on and off. Mm -hmm. You can recognize a jingle just by looking at it. So in terms of the, the spatial, visual spatial representation of uh, waveforms, for instance, uh, it's even more interesting, I'd say, or interesting in different ways. It's not a lot of time stretching, et cetera, but it's a an, an, um, uh, craft mm -hmm. that is different from music production, but entire, entirely reliant on. Think of how um, um, voiceovers or, or dubbings were done before and after and visualizations of waveforms on screen. And um, this ab ability in a, in a video editing setting or in, in a DAW back and forth, showing the video in a music production mm -hmm. software or the other way around, tinkering with the time timeline is uh, maps across. So I guess that answers uh, the other uh, potential area there across media is really yeah. what I'd say. Um, thinking a lot about that for the uh, preparing for the trial lecture as well. It's um, across media is, is, is really uh, every, everywhere you work with time and space, it's spatialized these days and then you get the same kind of mechanisms yeah. working. Yeah, it, I mean, it kind of reminded me, of, you mentioned the trial lecture, and I was mentioning to the committee members, I, I really appreciated the World of Warcraft <laughs> display, and uh, how, much of, how much of the display is taken up by a heads-up yeah. display that's organized by grids. But really what your point there was that, uh, related to the kind of cultural logic that Jameson mentioned and others mentioned, right, is that this is about efficiency and storage specifically. Yeah. And so maybe that's um, an er I don't know if I have a question here about this, but it's, uh, this might be another one of these areas that can, that can have an effect on timing just as much as the dynamic signal processing and the, and the filters and the envelopes that you talk about mm -hmm. would be how producers store their media. Yeah. And for example, I know like you know, plenty, of, plenty of producers that I've talked to, they don't, it's not a clean thing. Right? Like oh. they're grabbing samples from sample packs that are maybe ripped off, uh, like online or pirated in various ways, or yeah. they're, you know, or they're sampling things and they're not necessarily sampling precisely, right? So how we store and organize our our samples and our files is maybe a, another area that could. I mean, if you were to have yeah, a, yeah. a whole other chapter here or something, but, definitely um, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Um, okay, so the other, another question, this is related to, uh, maybe it's related to STS and the whole Scott approach to the things, but it's about this concept of like writing histories of the present, right? Because um, I understand, and one of the great contributions in terms of your response to software studies, for example, is that it's specifically, like you said, trying to avoid writing uh, an innovation-centric mm -hmm. history, right? Um, but I think this is, also gets at the heart of one of the challenges of writing about software and popular music um, is that they're moving targets that are changing rapidly uh, and they're so contingent on, on the market, on market demand. Um, and so I think uh, you know, it's really important sometimes that we actually have maybe a more of a history of the, the present uh, style analysis um, to balance the historical things. So I think mm. you provide a really useful history that frames the case studies. We both, both Paul and I really um, spoke highly of that, that first chapter, right? Um, but, but I still, I, I'm feeling, I'm left feeling like there's, a, that a sort of Foucault style history of the present is maybe lacking. Um, and I think that like an essential, like a real media archeology span would have to have that, right? Because media yeah. archeology span kind of comes from that whole framework. Um, so, so the short of this is that I don't feel that the document takes the conceptual framework of grids and sound spatialization kind of to its logical conclusion in 2023, yeah. like where we're at right now with our techno-historical moment. Um, so by way of approaching this, um, could you speak to maybe some of the more recent technological developments in DAW design or DAW-based time tinkering, things like spatial audio or artificial intelligence, um, and how those might speak to the arguments about 
sound spatialization, right? Because I think since spatialization is such a clear part of the, the yeah. premise, right, uh, it seems like spatial audio might have a lot to, <laughs> it might kind of shift the conversation in a way, right? Because we do go from maybe like a 2D understanding of space to more of a, like a 3D or yeah, immersive yeah. space or something like that, uh, you know? Yeah, that's... Yeah, you, you uh, pointed at um, something that I... Yeah, I totally agree that the logical conclusion of this uh, w would be influenced by a media ar archaeology uh, thing would be to, to have something meaningful to comment on, on the present, right? And I think there's a lot to draw on there. As I said... <laughs> There's a lot that didn't make it, <laughs> or at least thoughts and snippets and sketches. Um, there's a, a few stepping stones uh, in the DAW development until 2023, I think, that I have thought more about. The most recent um, developments uh, are more intangible, right? It's, it's hard to map, but the one thing that is quite obvious, I think, is the uh, idea of multiple temporalities, right? Like, um, uh, I, I, I only talk about the unified timeline. Uh, I found it um, actually very important to stress that point because we talk about nonlinear music production and editing quite a lot, and then we talk about um, so there's different uh, modes in interface design where you don't view the, <laughs> the traditional unifying timeline, but you instead work with uh, clips in an array and you trigger them and they are automatically synchronized, etc. But you don't really uh, think about the, the whole arrangement. You work in like a loop-based mode. And that's described as non-linear, right? That's described as, and now we're talking, now we're talking a, a new mode of temporality. Whereas, um, really, <laughs> the unified timeline is where nonlinear editing happens because you can mm. see the past and the future and the present. Because sound, after all, it, it's like people forget that in the perception of sound is all, always in the moment, right? And you have to channel the actual the listener's experience cannot be um, in that mode. <laughs> but interface design in, in Ableton is the obvious, like the session view. Um, display timelines or the, the loop lengths, right? So you can have different loop lengths in the, in the gridded view and you can turn it off as well. So in principle you can, and people use software like that in, in like, um, non-musical settings or musical settings that don't require uh, rigid synchronization as well, like in a theater or something like that, where it triggers sounds that last um, with different length, let's say. And you can do all sorts of nonlinear uh, performances. But in terms of the pr procedural listening, as you describe it, as I think there's a lot to say about this uh, presentation of multiple temporalities. Um, I was thinking something that um, people have not talked a lot about is, uh, and I'm not sure how much it is used actually, but FL Studio has this playlist mode, mm. which is a hybrid. You have the unified timeline, but you also have like a clip over there in the past that runs presently with its own timeline. So FL Studio is like modula modular, very modular, right, with windows upon w uh, in contrast to live. Yeah, so, yeah. so timelines are really, uh, there's a lot of a, a wash in information in terms of temporal positioning. Yeah. But then again, all, it, it's all uh, aut automated and synchronized, so you don't really have to pay attention to it. But it's interesting, nevertheless, as, as an example of how automation, I think automation, you mentioned AI, but, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> developments these days, like Bitwig have a lot of the, uh, there's conservatism, right? Mm. You, you don't have to, you, you can't include too many <laughs> really new features. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> the learning curve can't be too steep, but 
we know that the potential for, for really uh, innovative features are there mm. and will come. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a lengthy answer, but hopefully. Oh, yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree with the FL Studio does something different. And yeah, like you talk about the clips, you can kind of layer them yeah. on top of other clips and still have audible sound. So there's a sort of interesting space thing going on there. Yeah. Uh, and the timeline becomes sort of three-dimensional in a way. Um, so all that being said, I th all these new features and that you're talking, all the cool things you can do with these tools. <laughs> um, in, on page, uh, page 20 of your introduction, you say that, um, that you're claiming to target in this dissertation a period of salient media change, right? Um, and this is, this, this is sort of the big question that all media theorists have to ask, which is why maybe people have gotten away from talking about new media theory yeah. <laughs> is because a lot of media theorists would just say, this is so new, look how cool it is, look how great it is. And, and then they realize, right, that this is the marketing rhetoric of these tools. They want us to believe that, yes, of course, every new feature we put out is new. It's all new and we're doing something different. Um, so with all this stuff, all this whole history you've laid out, do you see us right now going through, is this a real, like a period of salient media change or are all the things that we, you just addressed that you talked about here, part of sort of a continuum. And is it, or the short of it, like is this a, 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 did we witness some historical break that led, that, that kind of changed things dramatically or is, is this all part of the, the long history that you're, you've addressed? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting. So I, I use that um, term. I can't remember where I, so Stern uses it. Um, in one article, it references uh, um, Simeon Don. Sim Simeon Don. Sim that G yeah, Gilbert. Simeon. Yeah, he uses that to operate. So, so it's it's these phase changes, right, where something happens in in the way that technologies uh, constitute meaning making, sense making. Of, uh, how production media lends us access to some something, <laughs> in this case, time, right? Uh, in, in transferring time into different channels of sp spatiality. So, so I, I describe these moments like the, the um, transition from mechanical uh, real space <laughs> on cylinders, etc., uh, to electronics is not that, it, it's a salient change because it, it can be uh, miniaturized and it's hidden from the user in a different way. You, you program it not on the um, programming, uh, you, you program it in, indirectly as uh, with all electronics, the button pushers uh, of the 20th century is, is uh, really what that is all about. You, you don't know what's happening anymore when you push it and it has to be pre-programmed, soldered, right? So someone is programming it and thinking about the patterns, but it's not you, the user, anymore. And then uh, the, the next change is even more, abstracting it even more into the miniaturized, discrete components of a digitized environment. But then you get that change where it's user programmable again, because you can address, in individually address each bit in the memory, right? So that's how I portray it. It constitutes how we interact with time in these programming environments. So today, we can't escape the elephant in the room with AI, right? It's uh, that, that it, I see everything that is happening now as a kind of continuum for sure because uh, we understand what is automated, but once that separation happens in, in authentic music producers' activities, right, right now AI is used as an experimental thing or by people that don't have a lot of uh, um, identity invested in the craft, let's say, because they don't need to prove anything, <laughs> they can use AI. But once we all use AI, professionals, and, and we will at some point, and write prompts, right, text, 
based instructions to make rhythm <laughs> would, would uh, be even more removed in, in a chain of indices, right? I'm still a strong believer in that there, there's no such thing as prior organicity, like um, that there will still be <laughs> layers to, to probe into in mm. a media archaeological sense, but it would be much harder, and I think that's a salient yeah. phase change yeah. for sure when that happens. So I'm glad I, I <laughs> managed to do this before. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all people want to talk about now, right? Already, yeah. how AI is changing everything. Once you get into that track, yeah, yeah. I guess this this question. Is, it, um, of course, this is another one of these questions where it's like, oh, what do you think about this thing that you didn't really have to talk about, but that I think is maybe important. But you did kind of hint at the connection, um, maybe the thin line between industry and marketing, like within the music tech industry and how they market their tools, um, and how that's related to uh, to your work. Because because when you framed your trial lecture. Right, um, you, you mentioned how grids could be seen as like a way to both reify and disrupt, mm. not, not to throw out a tech term, right? But, uh, but you know, you mentioned the grid as like this thing that could be a way to reinforce things, but also to push against them, yeah. which is I think valu very valuable. I also think that like if you ever plan to go into tech that your, your slide grids, we make grids, uh, sorry, what was the, we, <laughs> We make, we make grids, grid make, grids make us is like a very good uh, no, corporate Felt like a slogan. <laughs> I know, well that's what I was saying. But that was, that was great. But anyway, do you have perspectives about, um, about like the, because obviously your, your, your dissertation is, mu is not about the industry. Oh. But, but if, you're, if you claim that, the, that grids can't really be, like they have, grids simultaneously reify the corporate structures that you were talking about. Yeah. So I wonder if you could just speak to maybe the concept of tinkering as it relates to the, the sort of what you described, like the Palo Alto, Silicon Valley tinkering and how that apply, how that then may, does that apply to the musical tinkering that you're talking about? Or what is that thin line between, you know, corporate design rhetoric and yeah. the way that we make music with these tools? Right? Yeah. Well, it, it, it does uh, link up. Inevitably it does, <laughs> I think. So that's, that's also referring to our discussion about whether tinkering is ap applicable in this context, I, I'd say. So if, if you forget about the unhelpful connotations, <laughs> it is all about tinkering in 20 20th century and, and uh, going on in the 21st century because everything is, is uh, going through these um, phases of prototyping and, and testing on um, focus groups and, and beta, beta testing and uh, it's, it's all linked together, right? And it's um, and, uh, like all the uh, NIME people <laughs> here knows it's hard to, to market and, and kind of uh, brand an instrument in a way, a new instrument with a new form of interaction in a way that is successful or you don't really want to buy into all of that necessarily. So there's all sorts of uh, interesting complexities there for sure. And I would also say that um, there, there is a reason to, I, I could have drawn much more about, in about um, the marketing aspects or the um, cultural release of new technologies in my case studies as well, right? In, mm. in the, back in the days, it was all about um, there's this uh, phrase, I can't remember where it's from, but yeah, you build on something that people understand conceptually and you add to it, right? That means you buy into some kind of convention and then um, you need to find a way to frame your new invention uh, uh, to universalize like a scheme of use that makes sense to people. So it doesn't happen overnight that a guy makes a cylinder and then uh, he gets the idea that we could program it to play music written on paper. It's something that happens over the course of hundreds of years and then small iterative 
advancements. But although one, one exception is the Carillonur, like um, in, in these clock towers in, Bel in the Low Countries. There's all of these stories where um, they uh, did their craft for a lifetime and noted in their, there's a great book by um, uh, one called Luc Rumbut, uh, Carillonur, that writes a history of Carillons. Anyway, the point is they tinkered with their own Carillon over a lifetime and just noted it in, in like a diary or a manual for the next generation of Carillonurs. So we know a lot about the history of tinkering with Carillons because of that kind of local <laughs> private document. Um, so it, that was not kind of advertised to the masses. This is the best way to do it by no means. There were in localized versions of it. And then 100 years after that manual was uh, shared <laughs> with a Carillonur in a different cities. And so they, they could kind of trace the innov innovations. Right. Like the wrought iron pins that were differently uh, shaped in order to... That, that was one of those local advancements that over time were picked up on, but not branded in, like a commodity. No, commodity, like a... Yeah, see what right, I'm getting yeah. into. So it's uh, interesting to, to kind of address that both ways, I think. Yeah, I mean, and I, I would say, you know, with, moder with software, you see similar kind of um, yeah. shared ideas, but of course now we're in a, maybe a more proprietary world as well, so that would affect the ability to kind of have that type of shared. All right, I think we probably have time for one more question, and, um, you know, this is like the question that we've just been badgering you with forever. It's about the sociocultural <laughs> um, yeah. argument, right? Uh, so there were passages, um, I, I think especially in the concluding moments of your chapters, uh, that you start to, that start to address the significant kind of socio-cultural socio perspectives on the arguments you're making. Uh, one that stood out to me was at the end of chapter 3, um, page 14 of chapter, chapter 3, where you bring up the fact that the producers you interviewed, uh, quote, often use metaphors involving living organisms when describing their ideal grooves such as a breathing mix, body music, or an energetic or sexy groove. Uh, and you know, this vernacular language for describing timbre uh, and groove has such deep roots in African-American popular music. Hmm. Um, so I'm thinking about Alex Wahile's notion of music technology and black pop as desiring machines, uh, for example. Um, so I, I think in general, I would have loved to see you explore those connections um, between music and, and identity a, a bit more. Um, I was really interested during your trial lecture, though, when you brought up this idea of the grid functioning as a, form, as a way of, I guess you described it differently, but the grid as intersectional, mm. right? And that would be a concept I'd maybe um, that I'd really like to hear more about because you talked about how identity representations can prevent the type of democratization and access that the technology may itself encourage, yeah. right? But that identity and representation um, categories can prevent that, right? So if you are claiming that the grid should be understood as intersectional rather than homogenizing, how, how could it be? <laughs> so this is kind of a way to, it, to kind of get at what you left off your trial lecture with. Right? Yeah, sure. If you could maybe expand on that idea of what do you mean by the grid being intersectional in just a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to. So um, that was something that I... I had the, the Graham Har Harmon... Um, quote about the puzzle and features between being the important thing, uh, <laughs> for him at least, uh, from before, but I didn't kind of map it to the, the grid, the spatial grid. <laughs> mm -hmm. As such, I was more interested in how objects connect with each other in that sort of intersectional way. But um, in terms of the social, social and cultural issues that are uh, unavoidable, or we sh should think of as un unavoidable in any meaningful uh, discourse on music production, uh, even though I'm, I almost managed it. <laughs> and it's not by intention, but uh, just, uh, yeah, my focus on, on um, the materiality and, and the concept of spatialization. But moving forward, I would want to address this for sure. And then this intersectionality I struggle with uh, finding another way to, to use 
the grid. Like, like uh, you can compare the other huge metaphor in, in our time is networks, right? Right, yeah. Networks and grids are quite dis similar in, in, in many, in many's imagination they, they are similar, but still they govern quite different principles, right? Because mm -hmm. network is all about nodes and collaboration and everything is connected in a way, but grids separate and they, so there's a great book on, on the grids and biology by Philip Thurtle and he describes how um, our knowledge about bio, well, rationalization of, of uh, living things is mapped onto the grid as well. Right? Like we have uh, uh, different limbs and it's mapped out on, it's rationalizing how biology works. But then he comes up, com comes up with this uh, idea of pests. Like, that's, that's where I got the phrase evading the grid. No, uh, no, I'm not, not sure. I didn't get the phrase evading the grid. We, we've talked about that in Time Project a lot, but he talks about it as well, but in this kind of politicized way, right? Things that fall out of the grid, in a, in a sense. But then, actually, it's, it's just a different grid. <laughs> Think about the coronavirus, for instance. It's one of those that fell between our understanding of how viruses work and then it mutates and we maps it. And now we, we kind of have a understanding in how, how it connects with uh, our new, under it, it updates, right? And, and it, the intersections between what is outside and inside is really interesting. So if you, instead of seeing the modules of the grid as take, uh, the combination of being a girl and being black, for instance, that's two things <laughs> that might uh, leave you out of some, so that's a bad example for me to justify, but, but you see what I'm meaning, two, right, two yeah, I, yeah. intersecting, um, uh, marginalizing thing, or not marginalizing, but in music production, for instance, not being black, but like um, being um, a woman and also, non-binary, for instance, you would have to get into the music production scene, a, a specific part of the music production scene, or you wouldn't have to do that, but that's, that's one of the limitations or the restrictions of your, because those identities intersect and doesn't apply directly into the whole of music production scene because of the, yeah. So, so in, in that, framework, a lot of these social and cultural issues can be understood. But as I said, there's a, there's a push towards intersectionality in sociology and cultural studies. Uh, we should do it. And that's also kind of <laughs> important to, to step back from and, and see how just tracing up the connections between stuff also presents uh, the connections in a new light. That, might leave things as they are instead of actually doing stuff. It's, it's not enough to kind of just point out how we should address that people can have uh, several intersecting factors that leave them out. As you said, software encourages anyone. Everyone has a garage band, for instance, but it's not enough. <laughs> Typically, being a girl is not the only thing that holds being a girl and using garage and is not a problem, but there might be several other things that right, keeps right. you away from using garage band that are not addressed. You, we tend to focus on that one thing that leaves people out of democratiz right. democratization things. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So yeah, kind of thinking about the grid as a form It's new of to me as well, so <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> messy, but yeah, it's interesting great. for sure. All right, awesome. Well, yeah, I really, really enjoyed this. I really appreciate great responses to questions. And, uh, so look forward to chatting more about it. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you very much for creating another session of lively discussions. Um, is there anyone who wishes to uh, speak as an opponent ex auditorio? 
it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, then, on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities, I would like to thank uh, the candidate and the opponents for having carried out this um, disputation ceremony in a critical and dialogical manner. Um, the proceedings are uh, now over. Uh, a report will be sent to the board of um, the University of Oslo. So the doctoral disputation is concluded. Thank you all for attending.